Hello, peoples, and welcome to Esoterica Cinema, the podcast where we take two random films from the cinematic universe and discuss the hell out of them. My name is Jason Peters, and my co-host today is the charmingly effusive Mr. Ryan Siebold. How you doing, buddy? What's up, buddy? Thanks for having me again. Appreciate you uh, keep inviting me back to these. I'm pretty surprised. <laughs> yeah, they do. There is no, there is literally no one else I would rather talk film with, except maybe all of our wonderful listeners, of course. Yeah, well, we'll see how you feel after uh, episode 27, but uh, for right now, <laughs> I'll just keep keep coming back for more punishment. I uh, I really enjoyed these movies. I'm really enjoying this process. Um, I, I just thank you for having me. Absolutely, man. Yeah, we've got uh, some really interesting films we're going to discuss today. Uh, before we do that, I would just like to take a moment, though, to discuss our master list. So, Ryan, as you know, we do the drawing at the end of every episode where we select our two random films. We use the random number generator. And it occurred to me that maybe we haven't exactly explained what this list is that we're calling from. So I thought we'd take a minute to address that with the listeners here. So the list Well, it that- wasn't really a scientific process, uh, but it was a lot of fun coming up with <laughs> these <laughs> movies for you. Um, yeah, I mean, two, you know, you, two, you, two you, jackasses you, uh, like us are not going to do anything scientific, right? We just, we, we, we're one of those people that wing life. Let's be honest. Well, you created half. I created half uh, of these. You know, you picked half. I picked half of these movies. And, um, you know, some of these I was selfishly uh, looking forward to seeing. I just never got around to watch it. When you pitched me the idea, immediately a, a lot of the movies, you know, kind of flooded to the front of my brain about, totally. oh, I yeah. could watch this and that. It's fine. It's just an excuse to go back and watch some of these smaller films or more obscure films. And, and uh, you know, these are definitely two of them. Yeah, definitely. So, I'm really also enjoying, you know, that, that uh, you know, some weeks it's your movie, some weeks it's mine, some weeks it's one of each. But, uh, you know, the fact that you picked half and I picked half. And then what I'm really hoping for is that the listeners will start to contribute via Twitter and we get some of their movies as well. Because I'm sure there's a lot that, uh, you know, coming out of left field that you and I wouldn't even think about. That's, you know. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we we both have our sort of genres that we favor and trend toward but at the same time i think we have pretty similar tastes in films i think we've agreed about every film that we've looked at so far on the show um so it would be nice to get a sort of change of perspective add some films on there that you or i aren't going to come up with so yeah to anybody listening uh feel free to hit us up on twitter feel free to send us an email to esoterica cinema at gmail.com and recommend some movies that you'd like to see on our list we would love to see what you come up with can't guarantee they're all gonna make it we may sort of also do some sort of, you know, drawing depending on how many responses we get. But regardless, we would love your feedback on this and we would love to be exposed to some films that perhaps we may not have even heard of, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's part of the fun is uh, when these num- when these uh, rabbits come out of the hat at the end of the show. That's one of my favorite parts. Definitely. Definitely. Me too. So, uh, OK, man. Well, with that out of the way, let's go ahead and let's jump right into this episode we have a very interesting film to start with. Ryan, why don't you tell us about that one? Well, uh, we, we got two movies this week, A Cure for Wellness and The Lives of Others, a uh, German indie film that won a ton of awards. I had never seen that one either, but we're going to go ahead and start with A Cure for Wellness from 2017. Uh, this is a little uh, sneaky little film that came out from one of the highest grossing directors of all time, Gore Verbinski. I know we swore we were going to do these big name directors, but <laughs> Hey, they want to crank out some craziness. I'm down for it. So uh, cure for wellness. Uh, this one was always on my list to watch. Um, I, I really wanted to see it. It was the fall uh, Gore Verbinski's follow up to Lone Ranger, I believe, uh, mm-hmm. which was a huge commercial flop uh, right after he was coming off of uh, the Pirates films, obviously, he did the first three Pirates films, made a bazillion dollars on those, and then followed it up with Rango, uh, the little animated uh, lizard movie with Johnny Depp, a uh, little Hunter S. Thompson, Johnny Depp, and then uh, <laughs> and then this. And wow. Uh, so uh, real quick, for the listeners to get you in, uh, it's this is about basically an ambitious young executive played by Dane DeHaan, He's sent to Switzerland to retrieve his company's CEO from an idyllic but mysterious wellness center at a remote location uh, up in the Alps. He soon suspects that the spa's treatments are not what they seem, and we go on a wild ride uh, into geriatric hell. (laughs) Yeah, it's It's a a, fun romp. I I enjoyed this. It was definitely... It was a thing. It was a thing I watched. (laughs) Yes, it was. So... (laughs) 
uh, just in case anybody uh, that's listening to the show hasn't seen this film, we are going to go ahead and uh, play a quick trailer for you. Also, maybe it's been a little while and you didn't feel like going back and rewatching it, which I would understand. So let's get a little taste of A Cure for Wellness. Here's the trailer. There is a sickness inside us. Rising like the bile that leaves that bitter taste at the back of our throats. It's there on every one of you seated around the table. Only when we know what ails us can we hope to find the cure. What do you make of that? Clearly he's lost his mind. Our thoughts exactly. We'd like you to go to Switzerland and bring Mr. Pembroke back to us. What we offer here is a process of purification away from the pressures of the modern world. Your plan is to take Mr. Pembroke back with you. Is that a problem? He's a patient, not a prisoner. You have the cure? No. Actually, I was just leaving. No one ever leaves. Welcome back, Mr. Lockhart. Signs of concussion, depleted immune system. I would like to recommend a treatment. Think of it as a cleansing of the mind, as much as the body. Some patients experience visions. But rest assured, it's just the toxins leaving the system. That was 200 years ago. This is happening now. You said no one ever leaves. What happens to them? I saw the bodies! Listen to yourself. You're not a well man. You're trying to make me think I'm insane. What's happening to me? It's all part of the cure. There is no cure! Accept the diagnosis and you will see it. Wonderful here. All right, man, let's go ahead and get into this. Uh, trailer does a good job of representing kind of the general atmosphere of the film. This is a film that I was actually really excited about. And right off the bat, I got to say, like, I didn't love this one, Ryan. What did what did you think? Uh, I... I... <sighs> I had mixed emotions about this one. It was too long. Let's start there. It definitely was. Uh, way I was too really, long. I was taken aback when I saw. Uh, I went to. I ordered this on Amazon. I paid the money and I rented this on Amazon, and I saw it was a uh, what two hour, two and a half hours, two hours and forty minutes, something like that. And uh, immediately my heart sank. Uh, I rewatched the trailer to try to pump myself up, mm. and it worked because the trailer is beautiful. I yeah. mean, this movie is this is a beautiful film, gorgeous. Film. They shot the shit out of this. It's the sound design lovely is to phenomenal. Look at. This is a very well made film. This is a film made by people that know how to make a good movie. Totally. And then somehow forgot. <laughs> the most important and part. somehow this came out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's 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 start off with the beginning of the film. So this is the one thing that I will say. Uh, I will give it credit for its opening credit sequence. I thought it was actually really stylistically shot. Um, it did a good job. Dark, really dark visual settings are often hard to photograph. I feel like a lot of times it ends up either being muddied or obfuscated. Something's just hard to see. Everything was really clear while still being really dark. Like you said, it's a gorgeous movie to look at. And I'm going to come with a host of criticisms here today, as I'm sure you are as well, Ryan. And absolutely none of them are going to be directed at the cinematography, which is consistently gorgeous throughout. And it's really just a shame that they didn't have a better movie to put those visuals to. But, you know, we get this opening where it's just looking up at these buildings, really dark setting. We get the, you know, score kind of kind of kicking in. It actually reminded me, the opening reminded me of the opening of Panic Room. Do you remember that, Ryan? The credit sequence for Panic Room? No, I don't remember. Yeah. I guy that to the list. Yeah, I mean, it's not a great film, but I feel like, I feel like the credit sequence was probably the best thing about that movie. Um, but it does a really good <laughs> shot of, like, showing these kind of skyscrapers, and they look really sinister. And it was, it, it, they basically did the same thing here with that, so... 
it, it's not a it's an effective opening sequence and then from there all of a sudden we get a scene with this like random salesman who's like working looking at the stock market or something goes to get some water and has a heart attack now ryan knowing this film like why why did they start off with that I really don't understand why that scene is in there. Like, the salesman really wasn't central to anything that happened. And I don't know if it was, like, a red herring intro or it's just to be like, oh, something's going wrong. But w once we finished the film, I went back well, and I so was like, why is guy... that the start of the film? So, okay, real quick, because we already went through the trailer and we already talked about the synopsis. So uh, I'm just going to jump right in. And so that you, you've got the, the CEO of this company. They're going through a big merger. And he... Uh, disappears off to the Swiss Alps to this uh, wellness center. And his assistant is the one that dies in the first scene. So mm -hmm. he gets replaced by Dane DeHaan's character, who's got a check, a little bit of a checkered past, apparently. With oh, so SEC. he was on the board and, and, and DeHaan was like uh, hired to replace him, basically? That's who that was? Correct. So uh, th that guy that makes sense, who died least. in the first scene was the one that would have gone to that wellness center. But oh, okay. he kicked the bucket. Cool. And then Dane DeHaan, that kind of sets him up to be a bit of a uh, fish out of water, pardon the pun, uh, <laughs> for the rest of the film. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But, um, <laughs> yeah, he's okay. he's just kind of thrust into this adventure. And I think that's why. I think they just kind of wanted to put him on his uh, back foot a bit uh, going into this story and not uh, as a secured um you know, a uh, board member who is vested in this. I mean, he's earning something and he's out to prove himself to get this part that he's just been given. If yeah. that makes sense. No, no, absolutely. that's how I took it anyways. Yeah, no, definitely. So when they introduce us to Lockhart, who's the main character, like you said, played by Dane DeHaan, uh, he's kind of just your typical kind of like financial big business exec guy. You know, he's a jerk to the guy who's trying to get his ticket and, He's giving some, you know, Gordon Gecko speech about crushing competition or whatever the hell he's talking about when he's on there. Also, I just need to mention this right up front. This was, he was really oddly cast. I don't think he really gives a great performance to begin with. Um, we can talk about that later, but he's just way too young for this role. Like this role is every other person that ends up being in the sanitarium and every other person that's on the active board is no less than 52 and here comes this little young, fresh-faced 26-year-old. And on the one hand, they could have incorporated that into the screenplay. Like, they really could have made it part of, like, oh, he's the young guy who's really ambitious. You know, they could have woven it into the story. Um, but they didn't even bother to do that. I think someone just has a throwaway line. Like, literally, at some point, they're like, wow, you look young. And that's, like, the most we ever hear about it. So I thought that was really well, weird right 30. off the bat. He was, th you know, he was 30 when they filmed this. And I think 30 is a uh, kind of a critical age where you're – when you move from your 20s into your 30s, it's the first time you're given – I think, you know, in most cases, in a lot of cases, real responsibility. Your 20s are your training uh, sure. grounds for your 30s. And in my 30s, at least, were the, was the first time I was kind of led into the, the VIP lounge of, of life, you know, where it's like, OK, <laughs> kid, you know, here you go. Let's see what you got. Knock the wheels off. And so that was, you know, when you start to get manager roles or supervisor roles or whatever. And I think this was his kind of induction into that world of finance and business, big business. And he is a kid at an adult's table and they let him know that right at the, right at the gate. He thinks he, he's a little cocky. He's going in a little arrogant. They slap him with all these sec violations and they say, well, we kind of know you're a dipshit and you got caught with your hand in the cookie jar a little bit. Uh, you think you're smarter than you are, but we think you got potential kid. So we're going to send you to go do this fool's errand more or less. Yeah, I don't even know that they thought they saw potential in him. I think they also just might have maybe been thrown under the wolves or something a little bit. Like I said, to me, it just it just seemed weird. Like there's literally nobody else in the entire movie. So let's talk about except that. Except for the girl. So let's maybe, talk about we'll that. Talk who about would you later. have cast? Huh? Who would you have cast in that? Who would you have cast in that role? Who would I have cast in that role? Dude, you know who would have crushed that role? My boy Vigo Mortensen. Vigo would crush this role. Absolutely, one hundred. Nah, man. Dude, that guy's like in his 50s, isn't he? Like 50s. Yeah, and, 50s? and he, would be, he would be appropriately aged. Like he would honestly, at the sanitarium, he'd probably still even be kind of young because everyone there is like 76 and wrinkled. He'd be, he'd be, he'd be still be the handsome <laughs> one at the sanitarium, okay? 
Touche. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I also just really like. You just Ego want a better Morrison. looking man, you know, leading man. I get that, but I think the age was appropriate. Personally, I think I it was know. a you know a young upstart kid that's you know coming up in the ranks. Okay, you know what? If you want to keep the same type of persona, I'll 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 I'll, I'll meet you halfway. Colin Hanks. Colin Hanks would have been great. He would have given us just the the extra yeah, do you think twelve he years. Played, do you think he? Could, I don't know if he could have played some of the suspenseful parts. And Dane DeHaan, dude, I like Dane DeHaan. I think that this guy is one of the most underused uh, actors out there. Personally, I've literally never um, seen him. Everything in anything I see else. this guy in, I think he crushes. I would really? just, I just he learned, learned about Green this Goblin man for in the, first the Amazing time. Spider-Man movies. Just learned about him. Had no idea he existed. You never saw the Mark Webb uh, Amazing Spider-Man movies? The what? The Mark Webb Spider-Man movie? Are you just making shit up? Yeah, yeah. Who's Mark Webb? No, no, Mark. Mark Webb, he's a director, right? Isn't that his name? Sure, let's go with that. He did 500 Days of Summer with uh, oh yeah Joseph with... Gordon Levinson, and then Joseph Gordon Levitt. Like, uh, he, he would sure he Joseph Gordon Levitt, whatever. <laughs> uh, and uh, we uh, he was one of those uh, upstart directors that made like one or two uh, really good indie films, and then they just snatched him up on the studio. Did this big cash grab for a while where. Uh, they got Colin Trevorrow from Safety Not Guaranteed, uh, Mark Webb from 500 Days of Summer. There was all these like really little um, artsy, cute, uh, really well-made little films that these directors just got snatched up. And they're like, oh, guess what? You're making Star Wars now. And I was like, <laughs> as a film fan, I'm thinking, whoa, is that a good idea? <laughs> in some cases it was, and in some cases it wasn't. Yeah. I think, uh, uh, you know... You have to appreciate the irony where Sony's like, Mark Webb, huh? <laughs> Let's give this man <laughs> so, Spider-Man. <laughs> so wait, does this mean that like they're going to get like the Danielses from Swiss Army Man last episode to do like Thor 4? And Thor's just going to yeah, like this fart his way across the universe? Well, what do you think Taika was? I mean, Taika <laughs> was doing small little films. We have uh, Hunt for the Wilder People on our list. Wait we you do. see that film. And that precedes... Uh, Thor Ragnarok almost directly, I believe. Oh man, I just rewatched uh, what we do in the shadows the other night. It was so funny. I hadn't oh, seen it in such years. Such a great film. Such so a great so film. funny. After watching what we do in the in the shadows, would you have given that man two hundred million dollars to go make Thor Ragnarok? After watching what we do in the shadows, I'd give that man any amount of money to do anything he wanted. I adore that film. But well, that's a correct. That, I mean, that's a correct answer. Would you expect any <laughs> return on that money, though? <laughs> no, oh no, that would be a passion project, and it would be the end of my career, and I would be happy to do it. Go out in a flaming ball of wonderful, <laughs> beautiful wreckage. But no, no, we would oh. lose our ass on that, and I'd be out of a job right away. I mean, we'll always have the podcast, Jason. We'll always have the podcast, buddy. <laughs> Speaking <laughs> of the podcast, watch other let's get movies. back to the film. What do you think? All right, all right. Um, <laughs> if we so must. This, yeah, I know, right? Um, <laughs> this movie, this movie um, took uh, about the first hour, hour and a half, and beat you over the damn head with foreshadowing like right? I've never been before. I, I have a note 50 minutes in. I'm like, when does this start? Exclamation point. <laughs> <laughs> Like, we're almost no, an hour into this goddamn movie. When does it start? <laughs> yeah, I know. And yeah. uh, did you get the the feeling that this movie wanted to be Wicker Man so bad? Oh. There was, like, so many things. This movie bo- begged, stole, or borrowed from so many movies, I felt like. Soylent Green, Wicker Man, I don't know. Uh, yeah, no, I'm right there with you. For me, also, it was, which you actually introduced me to back in our film school days, is The Prisoner. I felt like it was going for, like, such with the... You know, the 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 random people in this sort of idyllic little seemingly unharmed, not dangerous sort of place that ends up being anything. But like I was just waiting for like the giant floating orb to pop out of the lake and start chasing people. (laughs) I mean, it wouldn't have felt out of place and I would have been (laughs) glad for something to have happened in the first hour. Right. uh, Other than all the foreshadowing. Look, I'm going to shit on this movie a lot, but I like I I kind of like the movie. Like I didn't hate the movie. It yeah. just I didn't love the movie. Yeah, no, no, I hear you. You do bring up a good point though, which I hadn't really considered until just this moment, which is like this movie is way derivative now that you mention it. Like it does pretty much I feel like any given scene you can point to another movie and say they did this first, right? <laughs> right, right. All right, so let's kind of go uh, double back to the plot at hand here. So 
this guy Lockhart, he gets sent on this mission to go to this place. He gets there, he spends an hour, and it's like, ah, what are you doing? I don't know, what are you doing? What's going on here? I know something's going on here. I'm gonna get to the bottom of this. No, you're not. There's nothing going on here. Blah, 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 blah. Well, eventually we get to a point where people finally start getting introduced. So, uh, by the way, can we just mention that the driver that drives him up to the sanitarium totally looked like Mexican John Favreau? <laughs> like, like that just like it was his Mexican bit, brother for sure. Um, a little but, bit. Yeah. But yeah, but so and then during, you know, as he's taking him up, he like drives him through the the town. And that's where they kind of set the stage with what ultimately will be the crux of the film, which is this whole storyline with the Lord Baron who wanted to start a pure bloodline with his sister. But then she ended up being barren. And so then he was like going to run these experiments on these villagers to try to solve her barrenness. I apologize. It's probably not a word. And then they ultimately revolt and then burn her alive and like rip her fetus out and burn it or something. Like it was, it reminded me a lot of like Midsommar where it was just kind of like this like crazy, ridiculous, like, oh, this happened and this happened. It's like, that doesn't sound like things that really happened. But I understand we're in a horror movie, so I'll run with it for a minute. They were shoving some exposition down our throats for real. But, you know, that was the deal. And uh, so I, I watched this with uh, my brother and his fiance, and she is from Germany. And uh, mm. apparently every little German town has a story like that. That's kind yeah. of the deal. Like that's huh. brother, Brothers Grimm, like Grimm fairy tales, all that in the Black Forest. The castle they actually shot this uh, at is, I believe, just southwest of the Black Forest. Okay. Uh, where a lot of the you know Brothers Grimm fairy tales kind of took place, mm -hmm. so uh, this is a very very German film, and uh, even though it's supposed to take place in Switzerland, where they filmed it, and all in that area, Austria, Switzerland, like I guess they just had love their 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 cautionary tales, and and uh, you know every it's always some tragic thing, and then a guy built a church over some grave where some lady died. I mean, it's just always. It lends a lot to where Werner Herzog comes from. You know, it, it kind of explained a little bit when she went. <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I can totally appreciate that. Um, I guess the I guess the film would start where, you know, he goes, he shows up. He's like, oh, I'm taking Penbrook back. Penbrook's like the CEO of the company that he was hired to go retrieve. And they're like, no one ever leaves. But then also like, but, you know, we don't make anybody stay here. It's like, oh, I don't know that I've ever heard that before in a film, but. Like I said, just kind of pulling from a lot of genre tropes that have previously been established. But <clears throat> yeah, goes, like Hotel California by the Eagles. <laughs> yeah. And then he like goes to leave and then there ends up being it's actually kind of a cool scene where the deer jumps out of the road and there's like the car crash. Um, and this movie is ripe with it's just chock full of cool scenes. I love the yeah. scenes. <laughs> yeah no the, the the deer was cool there's like this really cool visual montage that happens and like you're seeing these weird organisms and there's a bunch of like just kind of cool flashy visuals that are coming at you and of course everything's gorgeously shot it's like one of, it's a movie i really wanted to like like i was there there's a there's a reason that it made the list like i put this film on that list um a because you know selfishly i'd wanted to see it and b because it's probably gore verbinski's least regarded film and now i kind of understand why but Wanted to see for myself. Um, and, uh, yeah, so after that scene, he wakes up, and that's when we're told, like, oh, you you know, the doctor tells him that he broke his leg and that he can't leave, basically. And that's when we're introduced to Jason Isaacs, who's the Dr. Volmer character, who I guess would be considered the film's antagonist, though he doesn't really do anything until the very end. Yeah, he was, he was pretty helpful, actually. The whole movie, he was the most helpful antagonist of all time. Every Dane DeHaan was a kind of a total dick, and uh, he was really mean. And, and I get it. He was trying to get his homie out. But, man, J Jason Isaacs was really helpful until he wasn't. Yeah, and, and he probably gives the best performance in the film. For me, it's definitely and easily the best performance in the film. Like I said, I didn't really think I Dane DeHaan did a great job. You seem to think he did a better job than I did, but... Sounds like both of us think that at least Jason Isaacs did a great job. And it's one of those roles that you just get to relish and ham it up. Like he's like the German doctor that's just creepy and, you know, doesn't really. It's always that sort of simmering, you know, not not even simmering, but just sort of controlled. Um, you know, he's and his character is always in control. So there's no reason for him not to be. But just some of the uh, I wrote down he's that he almost gives. kind of a Willy Wonka character where he's got this. uh 
you know, super chill vibe, but something kind of creepy about him, but he knows more than he's leading on. He, you know, he's kind of like a German Willy Wonka to me. <laughs> totally. Now, the one thing I do think that the film did really well, I mean, in addition to the cinematography, that is, is the sound design. And as a sound guy, Ryan, you should be able to offer some interesting perspective on this. But I thought no, that the, no, I, I mentioned that earlier. Yeah, I thought that they did a really good I, job of just like a lot of a lot of times it's like better equals more. Right. You know, so it's like, oh, let's just throw a bunch of sounds and <clears throat> whether it's, you know, engines roaring, blah, blah, this and that. What I think this film did really interestingly is they would focus in on one or two sounds. So, you know, the scene where he is, uh, he being Dane DeHaan's character, Lockhart, first gets admitted and he goes to the window and he kind of looks outside and he's getting a sense of the place. And, you know, you just hear like a couple sounds. So at first you just hear like some of the shuffling of the older people outside. And then you just hear like a single crack of like the croquet mallet. And then he takes a sip of water and you just hear like, the very loud gulping sounds of him drinking this water and the way that they would focus on each of those sounds individually and kind of uh, drown out all of the other background sounds. I thought was a really interesting filmmaking decision. I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, no, I agree. Uh, the crutches when he's on the crutches to go look for uh, his homeboy uh, that he's there to, to take back uh, mm -hmm. Pembroke. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, everything, uh, was noticeable and usually you know a lot of those uh, sounds get hidden in the background and they and they're made to sound natural in our daily lives but I think it was intentional to make these things stand out and to really kind of heighten your senses a little bit and I really mm. appreciated that definitely definitely so let's actually talk about my favorite scene in the film and this is the one where he's walking through the corridor and it's kind of a little bit foggy and there's all the tiles and we just get this like awesome tracking shot. It's almost like a little bit Stanley Kubrick in the way that it follows him through this maze a little bit and he ends up walking and getting uh, lost and then he finds himself in this room and the camera kind of like pans around him and then when it shows us the wall behind all of a sudden it's sealed in. So he's effectively sealed in, trapped in this sort of like prison of sorts and then, you know, the fog dissipates and then there is the door there. And then that's when like a deer jumps past. And again, like all of this, there's just this really rich sense of atmosphere with the sound and the cinematography. And it's something where if you had just shown me that scene isolated in a vacuum with no context and, and you know, on YouTube or something, I'd be like, oh, I'm all about this film. Like that is a film that I am going to like. I have already decided ahead of time that I like this movie. Like I love the visual inventiveness of that scene and the atmosphere and everything that goes along with it. However, not enough there in the rest of the movie to carry us, you know, in spite of those scenes. Well, my take on that, and this goes in with the, uh, the, the foreshadowing. So right, right before the, the scene you're talking about, um, you know, he, he tries to leave, he goes to get his homie and they won't let him have him. And then he ends up getting into a tragic car accident uh, that where he breaks his leg, he's rescued by the doc, the head doctor of this facility. Uh, that is, uh, his uh, CEO Pembroke is under the care of, played by Jason Isaacs, and this guy just keeps all. He's like, uh, his offering of the water to drink the water mm -hmm. should have been way downplayed. I, there's there's a reveal <laughs> later in the film. They do hammer you over the head about it's that. It's all day about water, the water. Though, right? We got, dude, I could talk for four hours about the walk <laughs> and, and, um, like, so yeah, he's offered this water and told to hydrate because of the altitude and blah, blah, blah. So he drinks the water and he starts to go a little wacky. And this is where the wicker man vibes come in to play mm -hmm. because he starts to question his own sanity. Is he crazy? Is he seeing these things? Is it the, you know, what's causing it? And, uh, he starts to kind of find out um, the hospital is more or less a bit culty. Again, Wicker mm -hmm. Man vibes. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so he walks down the hallway after, you know, he's tripping out and everything. But uh, you're right. It's visually stunning. It sounds great. But um, this whole thing is all predicated on him drinking the water. And then, I don't know, man, water, 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 water. <laughs> and they even thing. talk then, about like how the water is like he mentioned at some point, like it tastes funny or like it's salty. And then at right. some point later, they talk about like uh, people becoming dehydrated 
And right there when they mention dehydration and you know that salt water dehydrates people, like you start drawing this connection and then they wouldn't, you know, they do the reveal like an hour later or something. And you're like, well, yeah, I kind of figured that out by now. Um, but yeah, well, so yeah, it's really it, weird. The I, I think I have four times in my notes, uh, fucking water. Like <laughs> I just kept writing it because they keep showing me. It's like, dude, I fucking get it. We could have shaved 30 minutes off if we would have cut out some of the water drinking. Yeah. <laughs> Well, and so another thing that was kind of odd was the the girl. So, you know, they introduce about halfway through, maybe a little bit before the the Hannah girl. And she's kind of she's almost a cliche. You know, every sort of like horror, creepy horror movie has the like odd, quiet girl that's like looks like halfway mentally challenged and halfway hot. Right. Like and so, of course, they find a girl right. to do that here. And. She just talks about the cure and, you know, we're going to find the cure. And again, you know, kind of for you, the way that, you know, the water was just hammered over head for me, it was just the cure. Like everyone's just talking about, oh, the cure, the cure, the cure, the cure. You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I get it. Like nobody knows what you're trying to cure and that's what you're searching for. Like, the, again, they didn't have to hammer us so much over the head with a lot of these different things. This was such a good movie that they just held our hand and walked our way through it because they kept like, oh, because she, she was like, oh, well, I'm different. I'm I'm a different case. I don't yeah. need the water. It's like, oh, OK, let's see where this goes. You know, <laughs> I just felt like there was so much handholding and walking us through what otherwise probably could have been a cool movie. I mean, I think I just think this was a, a really good missed opportunity. There is a good movie in there somewhere. And I actually do have a clip that is going to introduce you guys to the Hannah character. So let's go ahead and take a listen to that real quick. Something in the water? At the bottom. I don't see anything. Did it hurt? Can't remember. Better that way. I saw you before. You a patient here? She's just so much younger than everyone else. Director Volma says I'm a special case. What about you? Are you here for the cure? No. Actually, I was just leaving. No one ever leaves. The Hannah character there, played by Mia Goth. I actually, I had, I had like heard her name or seen it in tabloids. I had no idea who she was. I have never seen her in anything. So now I can at least know who the hell this Mia Goth girl is uh, when they talk about her. Um, but anyway, Did you I see guess it was Shia LaBeouf's wife. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. Like I said, she popped up in some. You she know. was in Suspiria, the <laughs> new one. Yeah, don't get me started on that, dude. I hated that movie with such a passion. <laughs> like, oh my god! Like, it's it's one of I think two Blu-rays that I tore out of my collection in disgust. Because it was one of those things where it was wow. like, I really like, so I love the original Suspiria and I went to go uh, rent the newer one, but it was like when it was still kind of fresh. So I think they were still asking like five or six bucks for it, but they had the Blu-ray for like eight or nine bucks. And so it's like, dude, for an extra like two, three bucks, like, yeah, I'm going to grab the physical copy. If I, if I watch it twice, it pays itself off. No chance I'm watching that movie again. Fuck that movie. That movie was horrible. <laughs> I don't know why you take a horror movie and turn it into a movie about ballerinas and dancing. I, there, we'll save it for another show, dude. Just just fuck that movie so hard, dude. It's another podcast altogether. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Uh, uh, and actually, I do want to play one other clip that I have here. I know we're doing back-to-back -back clips here. should probably try to spread them out next time, but... Hey, that's just how this one went. It's the scene where Dr. Vollmer convinces Lockhart to start undergoing treatment, which, again, why does he agree to this seemingly very odd treatment for what is a broken leg? Like, right. like he's got a broken leg and the doctor's like, hey, I can help you out with that. Just get in my giant 20-foot sensory deprivation tank. 
<laughs> it's like, I, am, well, I, I, I don't know much about medicine, okay, Ryan? But I'm pretty sure the cure for a broken leg is not a sensory deprivation tank. Well, I think he's playing along to get to the bottom of the Scooby-Doo mystery. And so he agrees, um, you know, to go along with this so that he could find out what's really going on with, because he's trying to figure out where his CEO Pembroke is. He's been sent to leave with him and bring him back for this merger so he could, you know, sign the papers. But uh, he'll be damned if he's going back empty handed. Sure. Uh, again, this kind of plays to Dane DeHaan being young, a little naive, thinking he's in more control than he is, et cetera, et cetera. So. I see, I don't really think the film explores that. I think that I think that you're trying to call that because you like Dane DeHaan. <laughs> Let's be honest here. I don't no, think the no, film no. does I a think good that job that's what of they being were going like, oh, for. this guy's young, and we're exploring that. Right. I think that's what they were going for. I'm not saying they, they, they succeeded. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> well, we agree about that, at least. Uh, let's listen to this clip real quick, and we'll talk briefly about it. Are you ready, Mr. Lockhart? Then let us begin. Life on this planet first came from water. We spent the first nine months of our existence submerged. Our bodies were extremely liquid. This sensory deprivation chamber simulates a return to that embryonic state. Think of it as a cleansing of the mind, as much as the body. Some patients experience increased heart rate. Visions. Even primal memories. I'd rest assured it's just the toxins leaving the system. Give yourself over completely to the process. And you will see the results. Keep a close eye on him. Yes, sir. Now, Ryan, this is an example of where I think the film really succeeds. Like, again, kind of like the scene I was talking about before where he gets sort of lost in this maze. This was an excellent scene. Just watching the clip on YouTube, I would be all about it. It's the perfect marriage of visuals and atmosphere and tone. You've got that really interesting sound design, you know, with the water level rising and how it changes the acoustics of Vollmer's voice. Um, really, really effective scene in and of itself. That being said, he drowns. That dude drowns, okay? Dane DeHaan takes a final gasping breath and then does not breathe. And then all of a sudden they let him out and he's like, <gasps> like, no, that dude died. I didn't like that. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I got nothing for you. <laughs> so he's, he's hallucinating, right? He's, he's he, or so that's, that's actually, the water and then there's not, that's actually why I brought it up because there's a couple of instances like that where it's like, Okay, well, is this a clue? Is this a clue that all of this is supposed to be, like, inside of his mind? But I also just feel like if that is the case, bad on Gore Verbinski and everyone else. Because you can't just keep doing that, dude. Like, everybody keeps doing that and being like, oh, but it's made up in his head. So well, you can do anything you want then and nothing has to be justified, right? So you've really got to, like, be careful if you're doing that. But it, it was something where, again, you know, I felt like, Okay, well, it was odd that he got in the tank. It was odd that he, like, legit is portrayed as dying and then kind of just comes back out of nowhere. So maybe this is some indication that it's all in his head in a fantasy, but I, I would hope not. Well, sometimes the—so there's these eels that keep showing up. Yeah. And, and they're in the, in the back of his toilet, uh, and then they're in this water, uh, in this sensory deprivation tank that obviously there were no eels in— originally and he's yeah. floating and he's doing fine and he's breathing and then all of a sudden eels start swimming by and he trips out he loses his air hose that's keeping him alive he suffocates and drowns really to your point and then uh when they pull him out uh, at the last minute the doctor that's supposed to be keeping an eye on him is being seduced by a nurse for some reason <laughs> yeah and, she like pulls um, her like top down and then he just kind of jacks it to her but it's like really unsexy what was that she's were just, they trying to kill him she's just standing there like i don't know like i felt like she should have had right. a cigarette and been writing like people reading people magazine or something like he seems way more into it than she does that's all i'm saying 
I mean, it seemed like a German thing to do. But <laughs> I just, um, I was trying to figure out, is he being, so was she sent there to distract the doctor who was supposed to be keeping an eye on him so that he would succumb to the eels or and drowned? I, I, and if so, were the eels sent there by Jason Isaacs? When they pulled him out, the eels weren't there. Where did they go? How did they get there? Are there like tubes for eels in that thing? I'd, yeah. Dude, there are so many things that <laughs> I know. The suspicion, uh, suspension of disbelief and all that. I get all that. But at a certain point, you can't just pull some bullshit on me like that. Like you have to kind of, and especially with all the hand holding they did everywhere else in the film and how they were spoon feeding me all the way through. Yeah. You can't just like make up some random stuff. You, I don't know. No, no, no. I feel you. Frustrating. It does kind of feel like they like held your hand where you didn't need it held and then left you in the dark where you could have used some light. <laughs> like, thanks for thanks for the help I don't need, I guess. In the end, we find out the eels are real and they're a part of the whole process. Yeah. But which is um, a whole other thing. But that's a whole we're going to get there. But yeah, <laughs> I, but then so if they were real uh, uh, so I guess they must have slithered into the tank and slithered out. There must have been some kind of outlet or something. Well, unless, unless but, it was uh, supposed to be a, a fantasy or all in his head. I mean, that would play into that, right? What's that? Just like, so just the whole thing where that whole scene in the sens- sensory deprivation tank may not have really take pl- taken place. It may have been in his head because like I said, you know, we've identified that he like legit drowns. And then the eels are there, but then they're really not. So maybe that whole thing was supposed to be in his head, and that was the point of that? Yeah, sometimes he's hallucinating, but then sometimes, you know, what he sees is just as weird. Yeah, so, like maybe it's like a Tyler Durden thing. In the end. Like a Fight Club thing where it's like, oh, sometimes, sometimes you're doing something and you're seeing it as the other person, and sometimes you're seeing stuff that's not there at all. So they kind of just have their cake and right. eat it too. I... I I really do feel like this is where the film suffers the most because I didn't know what was fantasy, what was reality. Even now, you know, having watched the entire film, I couldn't tell you. And sometimes I really like that. Yeah. Uh, Same. Like, like even hearing, like even hearing it out loud, it's like, well, that doesn't sound like something I would dislike. Like, I feel like I've said the exact same thing about other movies that I like for the same reason. There was just something like in the mouth of madness by John Carpenter. Do you ever see that with Sam Neill? Dude, I remember, I remember really liking it, but I saw it. I saw it once back in the day. I don't remember anything about it other than it was kind of trippy and Lovecraft. It doesn't hold up very well. Oh yeah. Just hold on to your memories and never <laughs> watch that movie again and know that you loved it. <laughs> that's well, that's but awesome is, and unfortunate. I, I do really love that movie. <laughs> yeah. So let's okay, since you have this, you know, your 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 brother's girl or whoever it was girl, German girlfriend, can she explain to us what the hell was up with that random ass bar scene in the middle of the film where they go in? Like so First of all, you're not supposed to be able to, like, escape the sanitarium at all. And, like, it's seemingly like nobody's ever left. But apparently Dane DeHaan can, like, take this weird girl that's, like, the special case and the most central figure of the entire hospital as far as the patients are concerned. And they can just leisurely stroll out of the sanitarium despite being under 24-7 watch. And so, you know, the whole time Dane DeHaan's been trying to get the hell out of this place... And he does. They finally escape. And all of a sudden he's like, hey, you know what, weird German girl? I feel like we should stop and get a beer. Right now seems like a really good time to just stop the escape and grab a beer. And so they inexplicably go get a beer at this random German bar. And then there's this, like... German S&M music, Rammstein shit that's playing in there. But then it's like a bunch of normal dressed teens. And it kind of looks like a... Like a like just like a I don't know Swiss German fanciful kind of bar or something and like it was just a scene that seemed like it was from an entirely different movie. Am I alone in that, Ryan? Uh, I mean, yeah, he he should have kept escaping, but shouldn't every poor sap in a horror movie? I mean, I, I kind of bought into that a little bit. I didn't really, really? see anything wrong with that. He was getting, he, he had stolen, remember he had stolen uh, Pembroke's medical records okay. and he was taking him to the vet in town or to, to a doctor or someone in town so he could find <laughs> out why Pembroke was missing all his teeth all of a sudden uh-huh. and what was happening to him. He was rapidly aging and all of this. And so he saw Pembroke in all these suspicious scenarios throughout the institution. So he found a way to break into the doctor's office and steal Pembroke's 
the CEO's medical records. So he went into town not to get a beer, but to ask the bartender. Bartenders know stuff and know people uh, to tip him and uh, casually ask where a doctor would be. He finds out all the doctors are in the institution. There are no doctors in the town, and uh, but there is a vet. So he goes to talk to the vet and uh, leaves the uh, his female uh, co-star there uh, at the bar, who then starts dancing like a ballerina. Um, <laughs> By the way, a blue what? dress that's based on a small little doll that his mom gave him uh, before she died. She used to make these little figurines. Yeah. And the last one she made was a replica of this woman, th- this girl that he meets in the institution that he's now on an adventure with. Again, the foreshadowing, man. Look, th- <laughs> this is where I've written, by the by. this point in my notes, I've written fucking water uh, three times. And then uh, down here under foreshadowing, I've written that twice. And I, it's around this time in the film that uh, it occurred to me because he keeps going to the institution and there's this haunting... Um, uh, place in the middle of the courtyard where apparently is where they hung the Baron and his wife. And the story kind of gets told in pieces throughout the film. But we find out there is a bit of an entrance that gets sealed up. He finds an entrance in the bushes. There's like um, some kind of grate or opening. And uh, you could hear water down there. And um, this is the point in the movie where I put two and two together and I realized that's a fucking well. The cure for wellness. They're beating you <laughs> over the head. It's wellness. It's a well movie. Are you fucking kidding me, you assholes? Oh, the entire so movie was and then just I was based like, on a pun. <laughs> it really was. It's I said, what, was hooked on a feeling pun. taken? And you just like made eel and bold print hooked on a feeling. And then you had the eels on the gates and you had the eels in the water. I'm like, oh, hooked on a feeling. That's a good movie. And then halfway through, I feel like it's all about eels. Oh, I would I would want to choke Gore Verbinski. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome, dude. Yeah, so the, the the film actually does kind of start to wrap up here a little bit. We get the reveal that Hannah is actually, Hannah's the Mia Goth character, the weird looking girl, that she's actually like the daughter of the Baron because we see that painting. And so it's like, okay, well, so she's either like a reincarnation or something like that, or, you know, we're not like 100% sure, but it's like, oh, okay, well, that's clearly her. Um... And then shortly after that, we get the dental surgery scene. That was one that stood out for me, Ryan. How about you? Yeah, I thought it seemed kind of <laughs> cliche. Dude, but it was just so brutal. Like, oh, I... So I'm like one of those people, like, I hate torture porn. And then, like, when you, yeah, when, you when you start messing with, like, fingernails and teeth, dude. I know, I know. Those are the two right. things where it's like, oh man, like I feel that. Like, and it's almost cheap, right? I almost hate when they do it because it's like it doesn't even take right. skill. You just you jam a, a, a if you jam a roofer's nail into someone's index finger, I'm going to squeam squeal whatever every single time. You know what I mean? Yep, absolutely, especially with some good sound design. Yeah, yeah. So, but Which like this movie had. That was but it was done very well because it was super intense and they totally they don't just like cut away they straight like show the drill go like entirely through his tooth that was pretty brutal yep <laughs> but um what but, got it for me was one of the last scenes in the film when they shove that tube into oh, his stomach dude, and yeah, they yeah, yeah, the yeah, eels yeah. down yeah i couldn't do that that was uh <laughs> that gave me the the heebie-jeebies yeah so which by the way uh can we also mention that shortly after uh he gets taken back he manages to escape again so like this place is supposed to be like some impenetrable fortress and like he bails out of there twice in a matter of days i I just don't like when films books stories whatever do that you know like let's be consistent here um so, yeah, I mean, they told him he could leave uh, every anytime he wanted. You're yeah, but no one ever really leaves, out. you know, like it's that whole thing. <laughs> you know, the other, well, the other thing, one thing I will tell that this movie was ripe with, with it was just chock, chock full with with uh, movie tropes. Again, totally. they be- begged, stole or borrow uh, so much. And uh, one of the many things that we relearn for the millionth time is never go to the local police department. If you're dealing with a <laughs> crazy cult. Chances are the cops are in on it too. One hundred percent. Police. One hundred percent. The other so, the other movie trope that we get in here is uh, the uh, 
the I drink hard liquor like it's iced tea move that a lot of actors like to do. <laughs> <laughs> I hate when they do that, dude. They like it's like first of all yeah, they pour themselves absolutely. like eight ounces of liquor, and it's like it's a it's not tea, it's liquor, dude. Like two, and then they just chug it without making a face, and they're like, ah, daddy got his medicine. It's like that's you've never drank the alcohol in your life, bro. <laughs> The other uh, classic movie trope is the old uh, plant and payoff, which you probably know from your writing days, uh, where he brings a shovel down um, <laughs> that he has used to break into How this How do I uh, get basement. this? And he finally today. finds the aquifer, and, uh, and he leaves his shovel behind, and they do this, and he gets into a bit of a tussle and ends up getting uh, away from a guard. But his shovel is left behind, and they do a couple of close-up shots of just a shovel leaning against there, mm-hmm. and uh, which is how he gets noticed anyway. And then the shovel ends up coming back at the end of the film, which is what our uh, female lead ends up finding to kill her uh, father, uh, husband, rapist, <laughs> sexual predator, Jason Isaacs. By the way, did you? Uh, was that aquifer? Is that what I heard? That's a good word. I don't know what that means. Yeah, it's an aquifer. Oh, yeah. What is it? It's a spring. Oh. Cool. Well, look at you, Mr. Uh, Smarty Bins. Of water. I suppose I'll just Well, we to... have aquifers in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're pretty much at the end of the movie at this point. You say that, but there's probably like an hour and a half left of <laughs> real time in the film. So if you're following along on this podcast while you're watching the the movie, buckle up, kids. You still got another hour and a half. Get some ice cream and settle in. <laughs> All right. Well, either way, let's go ahead and I'll tell you what, man. Let's let's go ahead and cut to the ending. So, um, you know, right before everything kind of goes down, um, we get the reveal that his leg was never actually broken. Right. So I forget he some gets some broken glass or something like that. Ends up, you know, cutting up his cast. We reveal, oh, his leg was never broken. It was all a ruse to get him to stay here and uh, be experimented on for whatever reasons. So he breaks into You know this... I never picked up on that? Oh, really? I didn't get that his leg wasn't broken, yeah. I never understood that. Oh. I just thought that he took his cast off. Oh, yeah. No, no. It was all, uh, it was all a ruse. He never broke his leg. But um, Yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah. So, but then he breaks into the tower and, you know, kind of like you're saying, the aquifer, excuse me, sir. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, so, you know, we, we see that the bodies are being fed to the eels and all this sort of stuff. And um, it's, uh, it's, it's right about that point that I think where Hannah ends up in the water, right? And that whole thing kind of happens. Yeah. Yeah, so she has this thing where she ends up, like, getting in the water and... I think she menstruates. Is that what happens? Correct. And yep, then it's her time. That's why he can rape her now. <laughs> yeah. So then like all these eels start showing up, but then because of the blood, they like just sort of circle around her. It almost seems like it's a reverential thing. And then, yeah, it ends up, you know, well, as you get that she was the Baron's daughter. So Correct. she was thrown in. They cut the, they cut the fetus out of the Baron's wife or sister, mm-hmm. sister wife. Uh, many, many years ago, like 200 years ago, and they threw her into the aquifer or the well. Well, well, well. They threw her <laughs> into the well. And um, so that, uh, I guess the aquifer has certain purifying qualities that can keep the eels alive up to 300 years. That's how they found this whole shindig out. So okay. she's the daughter that's been kept alive by this aquifer, but the eels were down there in the well. So I took it as she was like queen of the eels. Like they re- revered <laughs> her and they knew her because they circled her. They like yeah. created a circle around her and her menstruating vagina. And uh, <laughs> so you got to see her bleed in this pool. There's this crazy overhead shot, totally symmetrical with uh, these eels swimming around her uh, in formation um, and uh, while she bleeds. And so, yeah, that's how I took it anyways. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so we'll, we'll get to this in a minute, but the next scene, so it's like, you know, Lockhart goes, he has this scene towards the end where he goes running in and he's going to like have his like Soylent Green is people moment, right? And so he tells everyone that right. like, oh, there's no illness. And then, you know, they all get up and start walking forward and, you know, they kind of make it seem like they're going to go after the doctor. But we know, of course, that they're going to go for him. And so, of course, they do. And they end up like putting him in some sort of like giant iron lung, but like with like liquid uh, and then <laughs> I hated this and thing. then it's the absolute 
worst, grossest scene in the entire movie. So squeamish. They end up jamming a feeding tube down this dude's throat and then basically doing a transfusion and sending a shitload of eels down his esophagus into his body. We actually have a clip of this, so let's listen. The last 200 years have been the most productive in human history. Man rid himself, God, <clears throat> of hierarchy, <clears throat> of everything that gave him meaning. Tito was left worshipping the empty altar of his own ambition. <clears throat> <clears throat> That is why they come. Men like you. You're quite right, Mr. Lockhart. No one ever leaves. What you fail to understand is that no one wants to. what the cure for the human condition is. <laughs> Disease. Because only then is there hope for a cure. Definitely some cringy shit, dude. Definitely. So, Jason? Huh? What do you think happened to those eels? <laughs> I So, I was trying to figure this out at the end. What 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 is the point? What are the eels doing in his body? Like, it's sort of effective as like a gross, nasty idea. But what the hell is the point? Of these eels going right. into his body. Like, I, I don't understand. Well, I thought they were killing him. I thought this was the end of the film. This was his way out. You know, that I thought he was checking out when we were yeah, watching the was... scene. But, oh, no. No. <laughs> Just a moment later. You're not getting away with that easy, my friend. Join the view. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. So... If you check the timeline, you still got 45 minutes left at this point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so Ryan, dude, I actually, when I was reading the summary after the film, to just kind of go back and, and, and do a refresh before our recording here, uh, I, I read something that I completely did not pick up on, did not understand. We'll see how you how you thought about this. But please enlighten me. <laughs> okay, so you know how after they jam the eels down his throat, and then there's like the little bottle at the bottom, right? And you get that like small amber colored drip that comes out of the bottom of the iron lung thing right. that he's in, right? So app- yeah. So apparently, what's going on is. The eels go inside of people and whatever it is they do, whether they munch on shit, whatever the like, they don't really explain it. But apparently the idea is that the eels are going in and like purifying like people's bodies or whatever. And the 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 liquid that's dropping out of the iron lung into the bottle is the result of that. So in essence, how they get that little like serum of vitamins that they're always dropping into everyone's mouths. This is the byproduct of that. So they put the eels in people and then they secrete this liquid and then they drop the liquid into people's mouths as vitamins, which is apparently key. It's like a, what's the one, like a fountain of youth. Like it's the key to immortality. So yeah, we're apparent. So yeah. So very shortly we, we find out that uh, we get the, the reveal at the end, you know, the scene I'm talking about, right? With what? Okay, apparently with you the face off because I'm bad at setups. <laughs> so uh, what it is is we actually find <laughs> out at the end um, when you know uh, he is that Volmer, Volmer the doctor is actually the Lord Baron, and Hannah yes. is his sister. Actually, I think it's his sister. I don't think it's his daughter. I think it's his sister. No, um, no, it's his. It's his daughter. It's the fetus that was ripped out. That's why he had to the wait. The fetus that was ripped out of his sister. Up. Correct. Oh, okay. See, I thought it was his. So sis- he still gets to have his pure bloodline. See, oh, okay. So I thought it was. I thought. She, I thought Hannah was the actual sister, and the vitamins were keeping her alive the same way that they were keeping him alive. 
But you're saying it's no, the, no, because remember, oh, yeah, and, and so the, the photo with the bandaged face and he's holding the little girl's hand. I think he went and fished her out of the aquifer, and uh, and raised her, and they both had um, delayed aging effects because of this water secret that he found. So he was aging at a much slower pace, and so was she. So yeah. it took her, you know, two hundred years to get to adolescence, so that he could finally uh, mate with her to have his pure bloodline carry on more or less yeah so the whole thing was just a, the same thing he was trying to do in the beginning just it took him 200 years to do it now because of the fountain of youth shit got in his way dude why was that the th- why was I that the thing as- back in the day like like a few episodes ago it was the same thing with a gire where a gire wanted to start like this pure blood dynasty with his daughter why is that a thing yeah i don't know why that was a big deal yeah i yeah. guess they just thought it was like the for lineage they uh you know it was just his family his bloodline i guess i don't know yeah, I guess. Did people not know about uh, physical complications that creates? <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> yeah, so... But yeah, uh, so the water... he So at this point, uh, the doctor says that the water is too... Uh, you know, had toxic... Of, it, would, it would heal the eels, and it kept them alive for 300 years, but it had negative effects on human body. It was toxic. So what he found was that he would purify the water through the human body, and the extract, uh, even though it would kill the people... Because he was doing it on villagers for a while. Remember, he said that they were digging them up and they looked all dried out like mummies. Yeah. So um, it was because of the salt water. So mm. he had to run it through a body and the extract from that that would sweat out. If you recall, um, I had to be told this uh, by my brother and uh, his fiance, but um, he touches one of those iron lung things at one point and it's hot to the touch. Mm. So those are sweat boxes. Mm. They cause you to sweat out all the salt water and all that goodness from the fountain of youth. And I guess your body, he's using human filters. It's a human filtration system. And then that salt water comes out and uh, of the human body. And that little tincture that he gets out of the bottom in those little blue bottles is pure. And he's able to take that along with his daughter and that keeps them alive. Okay. That said, <laughs> what's with the fucking eels, bro? Like right? where did those, did he poop them out? Do you poop them out? Why? I, I want to see that scene. If so, I don't know. And, and why are eels the fountain of youth? And like, what, like, like, okay. Like you came up with this setup, but like, you don't have to justify it at all. Like, you know, I could just be like, right. Oh yeah. You know what? Uh, yeah. Nickels cure cancer. And like, bam, here you go. Like, just, I mean, I know you can make I, up I mean, whatever rules it. you it's, want, but I mean, at least respect our intelligence. Eels are a haunting stoosh. visual, and it it was interesting that they, you know, found that they that that that's how they found that the the spring had those you know elements to it, the fountain of youth style elements was that you know kept these eels alive for three hundred years or whatever. So okay, that's your your catalyst for the whole story. I get that, but then. You know, why? Uh, and they, they're creepy as shit. I get it. And I cringed when they shoved them down his throat. I just want to know where they went. And if you had to poop them out. <laughs> is that on, I wonder if that's on the extra scenes. Yeah. So like you said, you know, pretty much the end of the movie is, you know, like I said, she's she's officially a woman now. Uh, we get the reveal. He's he's going to rape her because he's going to, you know, sire this pure blood dynasty and blah, blah, blah. And then something happens and his forehead starts to peel a little bit. I think I forget who it was because there's that thing where Lockhart tries to like lure him into the trap, right? So he he basically like sets up a bunch of fuel and he's trying to lure her lure him there, and then he ends up like starting the fire, but it doesn't quite work. And then that's when we finally get like the shovel moment where Hannah slams the shovel in his head right. and he ends up. Uh, being literally turned into eel food. I did think it was funny that like he had his like face torn off and that was the reveal just because it literally felt like the Scooby-Doo reveal. <laughs> like, ah, it's it actually totally Lord did. Baron. Like, ah, I would have gotten away with it if it hadn't been for you snooping kids. <laughs> like, literally I, what I heard dude, when he and tore by his then, face off. We all knew it. Did you know it? Did you see that coming? Did you know it by then? Or Honestly, like a, I did. I got you a moment. I, I, I love being smarter really? than movies, but I can't say that I thought I saw this one. But I've also tried okay. to. So I used to I used to try to get ahead of every single movie. Like when we were in film school and stuff, like I loved being the smartest guy in the room. And so I would always try to learn everything about a movie before I even saw it. And, you know, just I'm well past the point in my life and I just like joint going along for the ride. So I try not to overthink these things. And of course, I'm also making notes along the way uh, for the podcast here. But yeah, so uh, I did not see it coming, but it sounds like uh, it was telegraphed a mile away for you. 
Yeah, but there was so much hand-holding in this movie. And when when you say you're going along for the ride on this film, you're going in a Prius in the slow lane. Uh, (laughs) In a little little radio flyer wagon being pulled by Dad or something. Yeah, I knew where this was going. And I (laughs) saw it, and then it happened. And it had very much a... uh, Whoever did the the makeup on this, it had very much of a um, a Hugo Weaving... uh, Red Skull, Captain America, First Avenger vibe to it. Like yeah. he had no no. I mean, it, yeah, he yeah, looked yeah, totally. to me like uh, Hugo Weaving in Red Skull. Oh no, totally. That's a that's a good comparison. I could totally see that. But then the film ends. Yeah, and, and then uh, Lockhart and Hannah bike escapes. away, and that's yep. <laughs> the way they light the place on fire, which sets the the cult kind of uh, you know crazy and, and lights them all up. That that's how these films have to end, dude. Again, Midsummer ends exactly the same way. Right. So they burn that mother down, and then he escapes on the bike, same bike he rode into town, and then on the way down the road, he uh, encounters the same people from uh, the city where that sent him there in the first place, from his uh, corporation, and they're like, where have you been? It's like, where have you been? <laughs> yeah, man. And then... They part ways and he rides down the hill. And then what was with that creepy smile that he had as he was, it was the last frame of the film and they just kind of hang on him and, uh, and his girl riding away on the bike. And, uh, he has this weird Joker smile to him the whole time. I don't know. Once again, I'm not, once again, I'm not joking. That's the exact same way how Midsommar ends, dude. (laughs) Like, I think it's just tropey. I think that's all it is. Like it was kind of the same thing I was talking about, uh, last episode with the ending of Swiss army man, where it's like, Okay. just these younger or not that he's young but like these directors sometimes they just have this thing where they're like oh I'm just gonna do this kind of obscure cool thing at the end to kind of make give it like a little twist without really stopping to think that like if that's true it invalidates everything that came before it like I went on that whole rant last time um, so yeah I just again I think it's just like well, we can't just end with you, you know, going off in the distance. We've got to have like some sort of action or something to finish with. Right. So let's just have him give a creepy smile and everyone will be like, "Ooh, what does it mean? And he's like, I don't know. You tell me. I'm not thinking about it anymore. I got a check to cash. <laughs> well, the film was beautiful. Uh, it was. The cinematographer is a badass. He's uh, done a bunch of stuff. Um, leading all the way back to Pumpkinhead in 1988. No way. He shot everything. Wow. Yeah. Dude loves himself some color filters. Or at least used to. <laughs> so anyways, he's man. A, he's a music video guy, and, and he's done a bunch of stuff. I kind of liken this movie to uh, almost, I mean, n- not nearly as good, but but in a similar fashion as Joker, uh-huh. where I feel like with the movie Joker uh, with Joaquin Phoenix, that you could uh, press pause at any point in that film, press print screen, and hang that frame on your wall. Sure. And it would look like a piece of artwork. Absolutely. And I feel like this film is very similar. Like 100%. Anytime you push pause in this film, you're uh, anyone that's out there that's going to watch this film, know that you're going to need to pause this film at least three times. It's a long <laughs> beast, and you're going to need a breather and to get up and walk around for a minute. Uh, and as you do that, look at the screen and say, wow, Ryan was right. I could print that out right now and hang it on my wall. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, <laughs> like I said, dude, what do you think? I mean, at the end, like I said, wasn't really a huge fan of this film. I guess if pressed, I'd probably give it, I don't know, two and a half stars out of five, somewhere between two and two and a half. What do you think? What about, what about you? Yeah. I mean, I'd give it a solid C. It's like yeah. average all the way through. And it excels in certain areas that, that are, that kind of make up for some of the bad areas. But at the end of the day, we're storytellers in the, in the film industry. And, uh, if you fail at that, uh, you know, I got nothing for you. It could be as pretty as you want and, and sound as good as you want. But uh, the story itself, I think also um, I'm going to put some of this on the editing. Yeah. Um, I think it could have been tightened up. I think the editing was poor. Oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, could have been a little more. You could have cut know, a half hour out of that movie. And, uh, it wouldn't have changed it at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I'm starting to think that Gore Verbinski is just getting long winded because Lone Ranger felt that way. All the Pirates movies are long as shit. I don't know if you remember that, but no, they all are like three yeah. hour movies. No, no, they're they're these huge. So, I, I guess everything he does is maybe just kind of bloated. That's kind of I guess maybe his thing. And I mean, look, now, dude, he made a lot of money, right? So I mean, he gets when, well, he, when you're profitable right. and you That's make a ton deal. of money, you know, they'll grant you those concessions, yep. and as long as you keep making money, they'll keep granting you the concessions. I think yep. he's run out of concessions. That's and what you, I'm saying. <laughs> Did you know that he was supposed to make a Bioshock movie? And no. uh, he ended up uh, 
last minute, uh, Universal pulled the plug on it because they were really nervous to make a rated R movie that was going to cost about $200 million. I can and understand And so that. we went and made Rango instead. Then he got picked up to do uh, Lone Ranger, and then he made this. And as I'm watching this, a, a lot of the steampunk vibes of the deprivation ta- tank and the uh, the iron lung things that made him sweat, like a lot of the set design really felt kind of reminiscent to at, like a Bioshock kind of feel. And I almost wonder if some of this stuff wasn't like left over. You know that the supposedly, according to Gore, um, Gore Verbinski, the uh, plug got pulled by the studio eight weeks, I believe it was, uh, before they were set to go shoot, which isn't long. So uh, for a movie of that size, that's not that long uh, ahead of shooting that, you know, you're pretty much ready to rock and roll by then. So um, I I was kind of wondering as I watched this going into it, knowing that, that uh, like, I wonder if some of this stuff was left over or, you know, (laughs) I mean, I mean, I can see that, you know, you know that like if they use some like art stills, production design, because yeah, like the way that it had the sort of like the the circular tubes with like the sort of oval glass display uh-huh, in the uh-huh. middle and, you know, very... Right, I, right, I didn't put yeah. that together, but now that you're saying it, it's like, oh, yeah, that's totally reminiscent of Bioshock. It kind of made, yeah. And then it makes me want to wonder what their, what his Bioshock movie would have been like. That would be interesting to see, get a hold of that script at some point. Real quick before we go, um, what was with the floating bodies in the in the pool when he goes in that uh, viewing room and he sees Pembroke and all his old friends that are out front drinking the water and, and shooting the shit playing crossword puzzles yeah. and they're all floating in that. What was that? Yeah. What was the purpose of that? So I I think it was like where they just stored the bodies, right? Or like maybe the t- maybe the tanks. It was like a capsule for the tank, but. I just figured it was kind of like a like a body farm, if you will, like like they just right, yeah. But but Pembroke was alive because he was in the in the sweat chamber later on in the film when they shoved the eels down his throat, and Pembroke looked over and said, "I never felt better." Well, that's that's the thing about like nothing nothing anybody does in this movie, like none of the procedures kill the people, right? Like, and <clears throat> I think part of it's too just that it's inconsistent, like we've said. But yeah, you know, people will be conscious and then they disappear for a little while and then it turns out they're being experimented on and even they they also do that at the end that really bothered me with with the Lockhart character where immediately after he gets the eel transfusion he's all like you know lobotomized more or less and like what are you talking about everything's perfect i love it here we're like Uh okay you know like that's where you know he's he's changed and that's how we're gonna go out like you alluded to earlier but then like the next scene he's like ah i'll save you hannah and it's like so wait what is the effect of this like (laughs) does it have an effect or not because it's really inconsistent they never really set up the rules of the film. No. I think that's maybe my problem with it. it, is it you what never it really wants. know what the rules are, so that they can just do whatever they want, and uh, and they've got and they've got almost three hours to do it. In. So <laughs> that's a lot of doing what you want in a film. So uh, you know, I'm being kind of torn here and torn there. Man, yeah, I'm giving this movie a C. All right. Well, you're a little more generous than I am, Ryan. Let's wrap this up with our three adjectives to describe this film. What you got? I got uh, brooding, mm. beautiful, because it was. Uh, Germany is one of my favorite places outside of the United States. Uh, and German is fuck. <laughs> I like that. Brooding's a good one, too. I feel like uh, you were you were uh, had your word of the day calendar today or something like that. <laughs> uh, so for uh, three adjectives, we actually share number two. Um, so for my three adjectives, uh, my first one is tedious. My second one is beautiful. And my third one is shallow. Just not a lot of substance. Yeah, to that I'll give you that. <laughs> so let, real quick, before we go to commercial break here, um, did you happen to notice the, the, so they play this haunting little song. I think it's uh, based on the music boxes, right? That his mom made. Yeah, that kind the of little like ballerina figures or some bullshit. Yeah, they threw in like yeah. one scene. It was like, and I don't even know what the whole the point of that ballerina thing. It kind of reminded me of like the little unicorns in Blade Runner, the little origami unicorn that the dude yeah. you know, James almost like. Right. I don't. I I I know you as a filmmaker understand this to be a visual metaphor for something. I just feel like I haven't been given the information to know what it is. <laughs> Right. What the fuck? And so, uh, and she knew the song and he said, where did you learn that song? And she obviously is wearing the same dress Mm -hmm. as 
the figurine. Mm-hmm. And so she's supposed to be that girl. His mom tells her, he says, why is her eyes closed when she gives her, him the figurine when he's a kid uh, in, in the form of a flashback? Mm-hmm. And, he's, and she's, uh, he says, why are her eyes closed? And she says, well, she's dreaming and doesn't know it. And then, so then later, you know, down the road, he meets this girl and she's wearing the same dress and she's like dancing and kind of standing and doing little moves on a wall, uh, almost falling. And then, uh, she's humming that tune at one point and he said, where did you learn that? Um, oh, the connection there was really weird, but I will say the very end of that song was very reminiscent of the, uh, the booze, uh, booze hound scene, uh, song from the Sherry Bobbins episode of Simpsons, which is my favorite episode <laughs> of Simpsons from season eight. And, and there's a, there's a line about, uh, can I be a booze hound? Not till you're 15. And, uh, not till you're 15. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and that's, if you go back and listen to that song, the little, the last few seconds of it were very reminiscent of Bart Simpsons. <laughs> I love that. Do I now have to go back and, re- and rewatch this crap film just for that you one really moment? Should. You really should. <laughs> no, I'll just, uh, just get the soundtrack. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, <laughs> that was the cure for wellness. Uh, stick around for us. We're going to have a quick commercial break and we will be back to discuss the lives of others. From the imagination of acclaimed author Ashton McCauley comes the next great anti-hero in American fiction. His name is Nick Ventner, alcoholic by trade and monster hunter by profession. When Nick gets hired by a wealthy benefactor to find the lost gates of Shangri-La, it's up to him and his crotchety companion James to deliver the goods. The two soon find themselves on the adventure of a lifetime. And in addition to being chased by Nick's longtime rival, Manchester, they soon find themselves being hunted by a mythical and elusive yeti that has been terrorizing the Himalayas. Featuring non-stop action and an acerbic wit, Whiteout by Ashton McCauley is a -a thriller-minute page-turner you won't be able to put down until it's finished. You can find Whiteout in ebook, hardcover, and paperback versions online and everywhere books are sold. Published by Aberrant Literature. Now, if you've listened to the last few episodes, you're probably asking yourself, hey, what gives? Where is the trailer? It actually turns out that for our next movie, The Lives of Others, there is no trailer available. Additionally, there are no clips because everything that is available is in German. My understanding is that there is no English dub of this film, and that's why there's none of these clips available. So... For this segment in particular, we will not be sharing any clips with you guys. Hopefully that doesn't lessen the entertainment value. So, uh, Ryan, buddy, why don't you tell us a little bit about this film we're about to discuss? Ooh, boy. Okay. Well, this all takes place in uh, back when there were two Germanys. I am old enough to remember that. I was reminded that recently when I got uh, carded at a grocery store. They looked at my (laughs) license and said, wow, you were alive when there was two Germanys. And so that was kind of like... In the back of my head as I was watching this. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm old. Uh, so uh, this takes place uh, according from Apple. Uh, they summarized this. Before the collapse of the Berlin Wall, East Germany's population was closely monitored by the state secret police known as the Stasi. Only select citizens above suspicion, like renowned pro-socialist playwright George Dryman, were permitted to lead private lives. But when a corrupt government official falls for George's stunning actress girlfriend, Krista, an ambitious Stasi policeman is ordered to bug the writer's apartment to gain incriminating evidence against the rival. What the officer discovers is about to dramatically change their lives, as well as his, in this seductive political thriller. Dun, dun, dun. Boo! Boo this <laughs> movie. Okay, so let's just go ahead and start with saying uh, dramatically changed their lives. I mean, I guess it did, but this movie was uh, not very dramatic, nor was it very thrilling. It was political, uh, not very seductive either. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, I will give you the seduct. I, I'm kind of shocked that you're saying that right now. It sounds like you didn't really like this film. Uh, I've been more turned on watching scrambled porn with subtitles. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let's let's address that really quick. I do. You, you, it's a fair criticism, so... For whatever reason, and I think it has to do with ticket sales and commercial viability more than anything else, this was kind of 
This film was marketed as a neurotic thriller. That's actually the description on like the Amazon page. There's very little that's erotic about this, if anything at all. Uh, there's like one sex scene and it's like it's the minister like sexually assaulting the actress which so it's far yeah, from it's erotic a or sexy scene by like a guy that looks like uh the guy looks like john lithgow doing winston churchill <laughs> and uh it it, it wasn't say dude it's a guy literally rolling himself like a mr potato head doll on top of this poor woman uh and he's in his tidy whities and then it cuts away like she's about to get and then we cut back to her response uh, uh, to getting raped and how it affected her relationship yeah. uh, and the dynamic between her and the, the German official. We're going to get into all that. Sure. All that the, you guys need to know listening to this podcast is this is a garbage movie made by <laughs> garbage you? people. I OK. OK, first of all, let's just uh, so look, we're not group think people, right? We don't use like whatever the mass popular opinion is to guide our own opinions. But that being said, like this is a seriously well-received film. I'll argue that it's well-received for a reason over the course of this segment, but it's got like, I think it's an 8.4 average on IMDb, which is good enough for somewhere between 54 and 64 on its top 100 list. This is a film that won the 20 or I'm sorry, 2006 best picture Oscar for foreign language film. It's a really well-regarded film. And additionally, I think that it deserves every amount of respect that is given it. And we're going we're, we're, we're to have to get to into this, it. dude. Huh? I was looking forward to seeing it. And uh, because of all of that, um, you know, I was expecting some espionage, a little more, uh, you know, pathos for what was going on, uh, a little more understanding from the talent. Uh, but this movie is Mike Pence, if Mike Pence was a movie. <laughs> I don't, I don't even know that I can necessarily disagree with you, but that's just an excellent way of putting it. <laughs> okay, hold, so let's, all right, let's go ahead and get into this. So when, when, when the film starts off, right, so we get what I find is a very effective tracking shot down this really tight corridor. There's a man that's being escorted by a guard, and he's basically brought into this interrogation room where we're introduced to our protagonist, which is Weisler. And when we're introduced to him, this is a guy that's, presented as being, you know, very intense, very cold, calculating. He's got this intense stare that he's, you know, levying on the subject that's being interrogated. And he starts recording the conversation and just starts grilling him. And pretty soon we we see that it starts being intercut with this footage of him, the same man who is uh, interrogating the other guy, uh, delivering the lecture. And so we realize that, oh, okay, this is basically him describing what's going on in the tapes he discusses the fact that it takes about 40 hours to divulge the truth from a man and if that man is crying he is guilty due to the guilt that he feels over it he knows he did wrong and if he's angry he's innocent because he knows that this there's a major injustice uh, uh currently being undertaken so we were immediately introduced to this guy, again, very cold, calculating. He's a smart guy. He's good at his job. He gets results. He's a ruthless interrogator who's working for the Stasi, the secret police uh, for the Republic of Germany, uh, East Germany in this case, because uh, the Berlin Wall is still up. And that's going to change over the course of this movie. And that's one of the things that I really, really appreciated about this movie, Ryan, is that this is one of the absolute best developed character arcs that I have seen in a movie in a really long time. So often we get this these is the of... best nothing. No, this is the best <laughs> nothing. There's nothing best about this. Okay, look, here's this the is thing. the worst. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, because here's the thing. So, so often when a character sort of takes a turn, it, you know, with allegiances, things of that nature, betrays the character that he was introduced to us as, it always comes with some sort of ham-fisted, overly sentimental kind of thing. There's swelling music and, you know, some really violent injustice. This is a film where little by little, we see the protagonist of Weisler coming around and starting to question the nature of what he's doing through his aggressive surveillance methods and coming to sympathize with this couple that he's been asked to watch for what he thinks is nefarious purposes initially, but ultimately it comes down to just a sort of personal vendetta because the minister who, who is in fact, um, assaulting the woman and has, and has this relationship with this actress just did it out of personal spite because he wanted to, to have her bugged. So, and the right. way that so he... let's get into this. Okay. 
Okay, so L- let me l- let me stop. I want to stop you right there because before you get too much further, I, I need to we, we need to discuss this because sure. that's actually one of the biggest problems I have with the film. Okay, because I felt that Weisler, uh, our interrogator, our spy, the key uh, to our whole film, he's got a character arc that is yes. to me completely unmotivated. Why did he? Uh, so he starts by, uh, exactly like you said, he starts by spying on this playwright and his girlfriend for selfish reasons by the minister, right? The, mm-hmm. uh, the minister asks the head of the Stasi. Stasi gives it to his homie, Weisler, who is like his number one man, yeah. uh, chief interrogator, all of it. I got a special mission just for you. Cool. So he goes into this, uh, Weisler, um, you know, uh, almost immediately, you know, doing what he does and, and documenting. They bug the guy's house and all that. But then he changes and has a change of heart. Uh, where he starts to protect these people and hide things from from documenting uh, mm-hmm. or documentation uh, for the Stasi, but it, it was never really motivated to me why he started hiding this or protecting this couple, uh, the the playwright and his um, actress girlfriend. Uh, other than that, he just became familiar with them. But if this guy is like the German badass interrogator of the Stasi, like, I just, why would he all of a sudden, and then he never showed any pathos or emotion. He just like, oh yeah, I'm going to hide this one. You win this time. You know, you get a freebie, whatever. He would just make these offhanded comments that never really showed any motivation for him withholding information. Like I was expecting him to fall in love with the woman or yeah, to that's have some what romantic I interest. Too. Um, you know, and, and be jealous. I thought uh, I really was expecting him to set up the playwright uh, to go away so that he could have the woman for himself. And the whole yeah. thing becomes a love triangle between the minister who's trying to have the uh, playwright put away and then him who's having the trying to have the playwright put away, Weisler. And then, you know, the playwright and the girlfriend who are unbeknownst to all of this. And this is all happening behind the scenes and trying, they're just going about their lives. But that's not what happened. And no. uh, it was very unmotivated, his character arc, I felt. Thoughts? <laughs> okay, so uh, because this is coming up now, we're going to, you know, kind of jump ahead a little bit maybe with some of the story elements. And, uh, you know, we kind of assume that a lot of you have seen the films anyways. There are a lot of spoilers in this, obviously. So um, we'll just go ahead and kind of jump ahead a little bit. So let me tell you why I feel that this guy is actually very effectively motivated. First of all, again, this isn't a film that's going to beat you over the head with anything. This is this is a film that's, you know, a little more sophisticated. It's not... Uh, it actually it just feels that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, so no. So I think that it's a film that kind of tries to resist a lot of the more mainstream political thriller tropes. This is a film that very easily could have been a different film that was very much more a by the numbers approach. And I think that they tried to take a more elevated approach to the material. And I think that it came through. So instead of, you know, again, these big dramatic sequences and these big dramatic events happening, it's really sort of a series of smaller, subtle events and revelations that end up slowly changing uh, Weisler, ultimately. So here's here's why I think it works. So when we start out, Weisler's been tasked with uh, surveilling this couple. Obviously, he has this one sort of, you know, kind of dipshitty guy that he's splitting up the responsibilities with that takes the night shift or whatever. Um, and uh, But for the most part, you know, it's Weisler doing all of the surveillance. And really, the key, or not the key, but what sets in motion his beginning to question what he's doing is when he comes to realize, which is sort of earlier on in the film, that the minister, as I mentioned before, tasked him with surveilling this couple, not because they were any sort of legitimate threat, but because he wanted to surveil the actress that this minister had fallen in love with, or at least lusted after, right? And so immediately he sort of feels like, oh, okay, I've been taken advantage of on this bullshit mission. That kind of starts it. Then what we start to see is we start to see the ramifications of the effects of this overbearing constant surveillance sort of approach that the government of East Germany has taken with their people. And this is sort of what the entire movie is predicated upon is that this, the, the people may not know that they're being surveilled, but they at any point in time know that they could be. And so throughout the movie, we see that people are constantly in fear 
of other people being secret police, secret Stasi members that are ultimately going to report them, right? So there's a, a scene earlier where uh, George, who is the playwright, uh, that is Krista, the actress's girlfriend, boyfriend, uh, they're having a party and there's a party goer that's there and he just sort of claims to one of the other people at the party that they're a member of the secret police and it's very loud and accusatory and then he ends up leaving. And so we see Fucking that there's Paul. This... <laughs> His name is <laughs> yeah. Paul and he's... And he's uh, lovingly known in, in my household as fucking Paul because this guy is a <laughs> douche. <laughs> yeah, dude. Like every every party has that guy, right? Maybe he had a little too much, whatever. But uh, but yeah. So like, so we so we know. And then through a conversation, there's actually a very very powerful scene that uh, the the girlfriend Krista has with George, and she's going out to see the minister for a tryst, and he knows that she's going to see him, and he he pleads with her not to go. And she gets this nice little monologue with this sort of long and uninterrupted take that sort of slowly uh, pushes into her face or zooms in. And she talks about how this is basically the position that she has been put in by the government if she wants to practice her art. This is her sacrifice to be able to practice her art because the Stasi and the government 100% control who is allowed to practice their art and who isn't. And we see that by the way that she's taken down in the end when she finally stands up to him. So he actually has this, when she delivers that monologue, he's listening to her. Weisler is. And he start, he actually says, sheds a single tear when he hears how the actions that he is taking and the entity that he represents in the German government, the effect that this is having on the people, because he truly believes in what he does. He truly believes that he is trying to snuff out the enemies of the state. And so when he is tasked with surveilling these people and we start to see how negatively affected they are by this level of oppression and by this idea that they could be surveilled and not have to not be able to pursue their art, that starts to change his feelings. Like he starts to sympathize with them and he realized what they're doing is fucked up and what they're doing is preventing these people from living lives. Like it's not, you know, just to be very basic about it, like he's not on the side of good in this scenario, you know? And right. we see that well, more that's, and more. I, that would, no, you don't. That was the intention of the script, but it did not come through whatsoever. The uh, actor, Weisler, uh, German Kevin Spacey, was completely <laughs> uh, monotone through the whole thing. It, it was a very monotone uh, well, performance where there was very little pathos. I never really bought that he changed whatsoever until the very end um, where uh, we see, you know, where he kind of falls from grace and then we kind of see the result, which we'll get to. But, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it just had all the empathy and compassion of a high school gym teacher. This movie was not... Uh, <laughs> I never really felt into it. I will say that the uh, the actress um, was fantastic. She did a phenomenal job. I thought she acted her ass off and did the best with what she could. Uh, but we were with Weisler for most of the film. Um, I do feel like he was in the dark for a lot of these things that we saw the uh, minister doing and, and a lot of these things that were happening behind the scenes. Anything that didn't happen in that house, uh, he even asked to have special permissions to follow uh, Dreisler out of the house to see what else he was up to and uh, was denied those permissions. So um, he was only limited to their romance. Um, and I just really, I have a hard time believing someone that worked so long for the Stasi that was their number one guy would be so easily swayed by uh, a, an innocent love story. He must have seen the impacts of what his interrogations had done in the past and how the lives he had ruined and the imprisonment and all of that. This is a man that kept uh, an interrogation going for days uh, originally um, in the very start of the film in that Stasi tutorial that we that you uh, talked about earlier that he opened with uh, and said the longer you keep these people awake, you know, they start to break down. And it's like almost a rigorous uh, psychological torture that he was uh, perfecting. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, he's a Nazi uh, commie with a heart of gold. Uh, I just, man, I wasn't in. <laughs> okay, but here's the thing. He's he's such a controlled character. I mean, this is a guy that refuses to, like, cry, right? Like, we, but, like, he wants to, but he can't allow himself to because he's had to be this this guy the whole time. To your point, I don't know that he's seen the ramifications of his actions before. I mean, yeah, he's an older guy, but at the same time, like, Every everyone, you know, the 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 person that you're mentioning at the beginning, he did end up being an enemy of the state. So I think the turning point with regards to why this is different is I think he comes to realize 
This is the first time that he's been tasked with a bullshit assignment. And then he comes to realize that, like, his boss is basically, you know, raping this woman repeatedly to allow her so that she can be able to be an actress and perform her art. And that also informs another aspect of this film that I feel is actually kind of subtle, but is actually there if you look. And that's, this film has a lot to say about the nature of art and the nature of the sacrifices that it takes to be able to practice your art. And I think that it's very critical of the nature of the commercial aspects of the artistic world. I think in many respects, the GDR, which is the German government, is a metaphor for the studio system. So what we see is we see the GDR represented by minute, by the minister. And the minister is just this gross guy who, like I said, you know, he sexually assaults her. He bullies her into, into sexually servicing himself because uh, so that she can continue to be an actress. Because if she doesn't, then he's going to have her blacklisted. And so she basically has to give herself to his every whim just to be able to get the roles. And I mean, even saying that out loud, I mean, that that's Harvey Weinstein, right? That's all of those gross predatory studio execs in the Hollywood system and in the filmmaking system that we see and we hear about that are being exposed, especially in more recent times. And so I think that that's a direct parallel of criticizing that studio executive system and saying, why is it that there are these powerful people that can raise and destroy careers at will based on something like whether or not an actress was willing to perform sexual favors. And so I think that there is, again, it's an allegory for the, the, just the messed up nature of the film industry. Was it though? I think it was. <laughs> Look, if animal farm, if a story about a bunch of pigs on a farm can be an allegory for the cold war, then, you know, the Stasi surveillance, it can go in reverse, can be a metaphor for artistic expression. Yeah. I, th I, th I really, I I really think that's a large part. Because, and here's the other thing. So but, here's, it, but it wasn't exciting. It, there was no suspense. There was never a moment where I was on the edge of my seat or oh, really I, I, I uh, had any pathos for any of the characters. I disagree. What? Let me let, let me Let me back up. Let me back up first of all, because I, I, I just want to, I just want to, I just want to, you know, try to, Back up this uh, this argument a little bit more. So, no, go, what, go ahead, there, go ahead. There, there's a scene. So it's when it's it's the it's when Weisler hears about their scheme and he's like, oh shit, and he draws up the papers and he's going to march into Grubitz's uh, his superior's office and basically have them arrested, right? And then by the end of that scene, he decides not to turn in that paper and walks out, right, protecting them. That's, again, a crucial mm -hmm. scene. That's a turning point. Do you remember that conversation that they have together in that scene? Grubitz and Weisler? Yeah, I do. Okay, so yeah. so the entire thing is basically Grubitz gets this report. And the report breaks down five different artistic personalities. So an artist can be broken down into one of these five people. Here is how right. we break down each one of these five different types of artists. And I think he mentions that George, who's, who's the playwright boyfriend... Uh, is is a type mm -hmm. four, and so if they interrogate him and keep him locked up for ten months with no human interaction, they will not only get the confession that they're looking for, but it will in essence kill him as an artist, and he will never write again. And it's when this information is presented to Weisler that he has the change of heart, and he ends up crumpling up the orders to have them arrested, and turns up turns and just walks out. And so, again, I think that is a very pointed criticism about the nature of art and the value of the artist and how, you know, silencing and killing art and artists is ultimately, um, you know, against the nature of who we should be as people. And again, I just think that's a reinforcement of that theme. Uh, yeah, but it was it was done in such a way where the. Uh, the actors or the the storyline in which to portray that allegory or these metaphors, things that you're talking about, that's all great. I, I, that part of the movie was okay, but the uh, through line of the characters that w are the vehicle of that allegory, uh, I just had no compassion for, no interest in. I was not invested in any of these people. Uh, Dryman uh, and and uh, uh, Krista could have gone 
to prison and I'd have been like, oh yeah, well that sucks. And I never really would have, uh, there was never really anyone I was rooting for or against. Um, it was just a story that was being told to me in a very dry way. Um, it, I get what you're saying. I do see that, but it, the movie, uh, I don't know, man. <laughs> see, it just I, felt I, was, like I just don't it was get it a, because I think the movie does a lot to portray the pathos. Like, so, you know, we get the scene where Weisler, you know, uh, he's, we kind of think that maybe he's starting to fall for, you know, this woman. He doesn't ultimately. Um, but then he like, you know, ends up like going to a hotel and like getting a prostitute, you know, and she comes in and they do their thing. And then, you know, when it's time to leave, he's like, wait, can you spend the rest of the night with me? You know, like, I think that this is a guy where, where the, the movie's allowing us to get the sense that like the guy inside of him, of Weisler is not the same guy that's outside, like outside he's cold and calculated and all of these things, but inside, like he is compassionate. He does believe in what he's doing. He is lonely. He does want a relationship, all of these things, but he's a professional that's had to set all of these things aside for the sake of his career. And that's why I think it's ultimately so powerful when by the end of the movie, he willingly sacrifices his entire career Everything of, you know, the 30, 40 years that however long it is that he probably spent getting to where he is, he sacrifices all of that knowingly to protect these people that have been oppressed by a government that he chose to sign up for and serve for. And that's not what he signed up for. And he knows that at a certain point. So he starts just redacting information and protecting them throughout the movie. And he almost becomes their guardian angel. It's a really lovely arc that I don't think I've seen done because again i thought i was going to get the movie that you thought we were going to get because that's the movie that gets told right that's the story that gets told in this type of scenario this movie had the balls not to be that story this movie had the balls to be something different to be the elegaic, balls? to be sophisticated the in its balls. execution absolutely absolutely it takes balls wow. to like to actually slow down and just let your movie exist. Like it didn't work for a cure for wellness. The last movie we talked about, but again, there's yeah, a but certain the, strength and courage. No, no, I'm not in, talking about Hollywood slick shit. I'm talking about the character's performance. I'm talking about Weisler being as uh, engaging as Ben Stein on Benadryl. This is like a boring performance. <laughs> one dimensional. I told you this is, this movie is Mike Pence. If Mike Pence was a movie, this movie is wet cardboard. I mean, I, I see the hero's journey. I see movie. what you're saying. It is, I, I don't but think, it's I don't just think done the same so movie. dry. You watch, you 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 watch, it's you so watch, dry. You watch this movie's a ball of great nuts without milk. You watch some Bollywood like secondhand DVD that was like an interpretation of this movie, like it, the Blives of Blothers or some shit like that, dude. Like you did not watch the same movie clearly <laughs> because I just wow. it doesn't. I know I know that you're saying words. Like I hear them, I can I can appreciate that. Like <laughs> it's it's a sentence that 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 semantically Man. makes sense, but but the 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 meaning behind it, it's just it's just I I can't understand where you're coming from. Oh, it's now like, he wants meaning. He'll watch two and a half hours <laughs> of this shit box movie, but he wants meaning out of me. Okay, okay. dude, well, what about pay the, me three ninety nine? What about the scene in the me, elevator? Buddy. What about the scene in the elevator with the kid? Again, we get these slow like. Very slow turn of the screws where we're slowly seeing Weisler become a different person. And we see that when, you know, the kid bounces the ball into the elevator and he goes chasing it into it. And Weisler's going up to his apartment and, you know, the kid's like, he doesn't even address the kid. And eventually the kid asks him something and makes mention of the fact that like, oh, are you secret police? And he's like, how do you know what secret police is? He's like, my dad, my dad says you're the bad guys that like come in and destroy people's lives and blah, blah, blah. And then we get this awesome moment where he's like, oh, and uh, what is the name of, and then he kind of pauses and then the kid's kind of looking up at him. And like, you know, we, obviously we know he's about to ask him like what his dad's name is so they can start surveilling him. And then he goes, your ball, what's the name of your ball? And he decides to move on. And, like, again, that's a very subtle character shift. We're what's just the not name too of your ball? Uh. We're, we're just not too long ago. He totally would have been, like, what's your dad's name? Like, put him in the database. Let's start surveilling this guy. How dare you, like, speak ill of, you know, the, the Stasi and the secret police and, and, the, and the regime. And that's the other thing. Like, we get a lot more of these people, you know, in, in government abusing their power. So, like, later when the guy tells the joke, you know, I thought that was a great scene. Uh, just tells the joke to Grubitz and Weisler about, you know, the commissioner, right. the, the commissioner or the governor or the president or something like that. Like some, some authority that guy figure. was cool. Yeah. Whoever that was, was dope. I like that guy. Yeah. And, 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 you know, like 
basically group it's like oh no 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 tell me the joke no I, I love jokes and then like you know he lets them tell this like fucked up joke about like their leader and he's, he basically looks at him and smiles is like cool you're gonna die for that homie but great joke no i'm just kidding you're right. not gonna die I love that guy. but i'm kidding you are gonna die <laughs> and it's like so again dude this just this whole like oppressive government where everybody's constantly in fear you know, not able to speak and their mind, you know, practice their art. Everything is controlled by this oppressive regime. And I think that, you know, because the movie doesn't use a bunch of bullshit, you know, swelling violins and, you know, people break down dramatically and have these like huge expressive, like it's confident enough in what it is. Entertaining performances, <laughs> engaging it's performances. It's confident enough in what it is to not, to not have to succumb to like, baser cinematic instincts like that yeah i get i mean yeah i mean if all you want is a story <laughs> read a book <laughs> i don't i don't and you I can don't. imagine it how you want oh man you're, you're you're killing me here dude you're killing me i mean like it was just dry it was and maybe it's because it's um you know uh Werner herzog style german uh shit you know where it's like uh, this is my performance, and I'm bringing the, uh, you know, the uh, action and the uh, emotion to the listener who is listening. Uh, we're going to change directions uh, right now, and uh, you know, go in a different way. Where now I am compassionate, and you will feel for me uh, in my future when I lose my job and go into the mail room. <laughs> Yeah, again, I don't understand why you're being so, like, callous about the fact that this guy, like, literally I, you threw know away his movie, entire movie, career for these people. He spent five was, years steam opening letters just to protect these people. And you're like, meh, yeah. whatever. Eh. Right. Makes no sense. Yeah, right. And that's on the movie, by the way. That's not on me. Because if you haven't gotten me engaged enough in your characters by the... By the way, this movie, and I'm going to, spoiler alert, we're going to jump, jump, be jumping around a little bit here because uh, just the nature of this conversation requires it. But this movie ends in no less than three time jumps of a four-year period, a two-year period, and another two-year period, all Correct. in the time uh, stamp of about eight minutes. So they yada, yada, yada the fuck out of this ending. And <laughs> they were just like, oh, and then this happened. Oh, and then this happened. And then that happened. And you're like, aw. Me, I'm like, wait, what? You can't end a movie with three time jumps. That's fucking horseshit. <laughs> the last person to do that was Peter Jackson in part three of The Lord of the Rings, and we ate his ass for it. Yeah, okay, look. So, I mean, I, I guess I'll be willing to grant you that, like, we probably didn't need the part where he, like, after... So, at the end of the movie, George finds out that he was being surveilled the whole time. The minister tells him in the theater when they both step outside because they're getting sort of like flashbacks to performances with Krista. And George says, hey, like, why was I exempt from surveillance? And then the guy's like, we were surveilling you the whole time. And so then he's like, what the hell? He goes and he requests the files uh, that were made public with regards to the surveillance project that was entitled Project Laszlo. He was Laszlo, the subject of the surveillance. He ends up reading all of the documentation, and it's through that that he discovers that the Weisler character ended up protecting him through all of this. And he goes to find him, and he sees him, and he's a male clerk at this point in this really poor, run-down segment of their society, a bunch of graffiti on the walls, etc. And, you know, he travels all this way to find him and thank him, and then he can't bring himself ultimately to that, that that rang a little hollow i'm willing to grant you that um i didn't think it needed to I, I didn't see ultimately why he couldn't he didn't go talk to him like george wasn't necessarily a reticent figure at all throughout the, the movie so what you know again i'll grant you that but that's like five minutes of the ending dude and then from there it makes perfect and then it's it ends on a very emotional note where the guy Weisler is walking and he goes to the bookstore and he's got a new book and it's dedicated to him. You know, it's called Sonata for a Good Man, I think. And George ends up writing in the dedication, you know, thanks to, you know, whatever his number was, like WW72, whatever, um, you know, for your sacrifice, etc. And then he goes to buy the book and the guy's like, can I gift wrap this for you, sir? And he's like, no, thanks. It's for me. And it kind of ends. And like, I thought that was such a sweet, tender moment. Like... And, and so, 
again, I am having, I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand what you're talking about, but all I keep doing is finding examples of the exact opposite of what you're saying. No, no, thank you. The book is for me. <laughs> I intend to read it. Uh, it's dedicated to my uh, my previous Stasi name. Uh, it's very interesting. It so, has pages. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is that like you're a basic bitch, and you basically need tons of overflowing emotion, bitch. and you need it to basically you need all of your stuff written by Donald Kaufman. This is a, this is a movie by Charlie Kaufman. You know, about flowers, except it's about espionage. And, you know, you, Mr. Donald Kaufman, needs to come in and get your big Hollywood ending with your big emotional breakdowns and your bullshit chase scenes. And I I don't agree. I think this film is great for what it is. It's perfect for what it is. I really struggled. Uh, you know what it was? I really struggled to find out what, to, to try to realize what genre this movie was. Because I think I expected it to be one thing and it was not. Sure. It was not espionage. It was not a thriller. It was not yeah. erotic. Uh, Definitely it, not erotic. it was a drama. I mean, it was a deep seated drama. And I think if I had sat I down uh, and turned the movie on and watched a drama, expecting to watch a drama, excuse me, um, I think I would have been a little more engaged in what was going on. But I kept expecting the political thriller side to kick in or the espionage side to kick in or some kind of love triangle to start. And it didn't. It was just a man protecting a couple. Uh, and it was, it was, you have to admit this was a dry movie. Uh, maybe if I was expecting to watch a dry movie, I'd have been a little more engaged. But uh, if you're expecting one thing, uh, even if that thing is oatmeal, and then you get a <laughs> bowl of dry grape nuts that doesn't have any milk in it, then you're, you're going to be, your palate's going to be like, oh, Jesus, what the fuck is this? And then you, until you chomp slowly on the grape nuts and swallow them, as, you know, the gravel just goes down your throat. And then at the end, I'm like, what did you just do? And you're like, what, you don't like grape nuts? Dude, it's cereal. And I'm like, fuck you. You, I, you told me I was eating oatmeal. So, 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 so basically if like Ryan, you have some sort of advanced adult ADD and you can't sit still for 15 minutes and appreciate a solid, confidently told story, maybe this won't be for you. But if like me, you like quality, I think that you're going to quite enjoy it. Okay. So Ryan, let's, and look, I, 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 do you think if you're out there and you read uh, the comics in the New Yorker magazine and laugh for five minutes, you're going to love this movie. <laughs> yeah, but if you guy. read the New Yorker magazine and read the comments and think, wow, that's some pretentious shit. I don't get half of it. And why is there an elephant in the picture? Then maybe this movie isn't for you. <laughs> Here's the thing, man. I do. I, I get what you're saying. And I get that. Like, See, here's a movie that I I was prepared for it to be that movie ultimately. Like I I get that it could have been that movie. Uh I thought that it did a really good job of not being that movie. I thought that the, the break-in scenes were really effectively constructed. I found them to be tense and thrilling the way that the camera work and the editing and the performances, everything like that came together. I thought it was really strong. But that being said, yeah, it was more of a it was more, it was more of a drama. Absolutely. You know, I think, and maybe you're right. Maybe it was just that it, it was Mark, you know, when you market something as an erotic political thriller and it ends up being a, you know, solid drama with political thriller elements kind of strewn through it and no eroticism whatsoever. You know, you think you're going to get the German, you know, Mickey Rourke from 1984 movie. And then all of a sudden it's this like, you know, <laughs> deep think piece. Like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe there's something. And, and again, the first thing. I thought when I came out of that is why did they market it that way? You know, it definitely, it, it did yeah, set it up right. to be a different That is film, weird. You know? And yeah, you know, it's like I sometimes we're... Hey, we agreed on something. Hey, look at that. It can be done, <laughs> right? But yeah, you know, it's like that one time that you like, you know, you take a swig of, you know, the bottle of water and then you forgot that like three months ago, like you put some vodka in that when you went to Coachella and you're just like, oh my God, I was yeah. expecting water. Like this just completely took me by surprise. Like... But and if you told like me it was vodka, I could have taken the shot. Yeah, exactly. Put my big you would have gone in ready for vodka. A shot of vodka. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. So, I mean, maybe there's something to that. So you didn't, you didn't, you didn't dig anything like with the typewriter at the end and the whole kind of hunt for that. And you know, by that point, I I had stopped caring. Check this out in my <laughs> notes, enough. and I shit you not. Four four notes in, uh, it says. One and a half hours in, realizing I need more notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Because uh, I, I honestly, I was like, man, there's nothing interesting to even write about. I, <laughs> I rape is hard. 
uh, Rape is Hard to Watch, German Kevin Spacey. Like, these are the few things I have prior to that. Um, you know, I thought, uh, so, and then uh, my, my wrap-up note, uh, my overall summarization was how meta this film was okay. because I felt like it was a, uh, a tragic tale of telling you the um, outcome of what it what it means to have emotions and feel, and yet the movie itself was so boring, so it was subconsciously teaching me not to care or feel. So, uh, <laughs> like, Fair that's enough, the most buddy. German Fair shit enough. I've ever heard in my life. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I think this is good. I think this is healthy for us. You know, we needed some conflict between us. We've been, like, way too on the mark with, you know, I think the we've done, this is going to be the sixth film that we've reviewed at this point, and so... We've agreed on the previous five, pretty much spot on. You liked a, little, a cure for wellness a little bit more than I did, but we both kind of, you know, had the same, you know, two and a half, three star range for it. Um, yeah, this is right. so. You know, again, it's good for us. We worked through it. You know, little therapy session. We came out stronger on the on the other end, I think, buddy. Um, let's go ahead and uh, you know, still we still got to wrap this up like we always do. So let's hear, <laughs> let's hear your three adjectives. Uh, I mean. Uh, so here's what I'd like to do. Instead of instead of reading uh, three adjectives, could I go through my little list of things I thought this movie was like? Oh, sure. I've Absolutely, already used man. about let's, ten of let's them. Improv uh, this bitch. Go to, for it. To, to mild comedic effect throughout the uh, podcast, but let's go down the list. Absolutely. This movie is like week old Ezekiel bread with nothing on it. <laughs> what the hell is this Ezekiel movie? Is bread? A, this movie is a plain triscuit with no cheeses or meats. This movie is like eating raw, unseasoned corn on the cob. This movie has all the excitement of a Bob Dole presidential campaign rally. <laughs> this movie was as exciting as spending your weekend using fake cocaine because you didn't want to waste any. <laughs> this <laughs> this movie going, had all dude. the erotic Keep passion. Going, let's go. <laughs> this movie had all the erotic passion of sloss meeting. I've been more. <laughs> uh, I. This movie had the enjoyment of Nyquil flavored baby food. Get him. This movie was as frustrating as writing left-handed on a dry erase board. <laughs> Get That's for em. the lefties out there. That's for the lefties in the leftorium. Uh, <laughs> and lastly, this movie was as fun as watching the Westminster Dog Show if all the dogs were turtles. <laughs> <laughs> These are my notes. These are things that I was Excellent. writing as watching while I was watching the movie. Yeah. Oh yeah. So no, that's I'm... that's my those are my that's <laughs> I think that covers my adjectives. That's that about that's how I felt that's about way movie. more illustrative. Uh, you know what? I w- I, <laughs> I don't even want to give them, but I'm going to just because I hope that they piss you off with how much you're going to disagree with them. I felt that this movie. Uh, if engaging is one of them, if suspenseful so, so is one of them. So I don't have them, engaging. I have sexy is one of them. Captivating, <laughs> not just engaging. Captivating. captivating. Yeah, because you're held captive by this movie. It is captivating. All two yeah, and a half you're, you're hours captive. of this film. <laughs> okay. Yep. This is a film that is assured. <laughs> it's assured, confident. It knows what it is. It doesn't have to bow down to lesser and baser genre instincts. And. Yep. This is a film that is technically proficient, man. Like, it's... We didn't even really talk about that, but, like, you really didn't appreciate any of, like, the camera work, the set design, the editing, the way they incorporated no, the No, we're going to get into green. that. I'm actually going to get into that. Yeah. Go ahead, though. Finish your adjectives. <laughs> no, that's it. So, just to summarize, <laughs> assured, technically proficient, and captivating. All right. So uh, this is the part of the show, right, where we compare and contrast. Do you want to dive into that? Is that cool? I do. Because I got something to say. I do. But before that, real quick, uh, out of five stars, man, put put a star rating on it. What are you giving it? Two and a half. Two and a half. Okay. I'm so I've actually decided that I'm going to uh, incorporate quarter stars because I'm going to use star search rules. So I'm going to go ahead and give this. Four and three quarter out of five stars. That's wow. Right, That's right. Wow. Ryan. This is a great film. Wow. Do not allow Ryan's shitty opinion to steer you otherwise. This is a great film. Well worth your time. It deserves every accolade that it received. The acting is phenomenal. The construction is phenomenal. Ryan, go ahead and kick off our comparison feature. Well, so I felt like this was uh, a, a almost the exact opposite of a cure for wellness because I felt where cure for wellness succeeded, this movie failed and vice versa. I thought that uh, I was way more interested 
in um, the overall kind of like underlying story of what they were trying to do in this film. But technically, I thought that it failed in the acting and the music, um, the sound design, the uh, cinematography. It was all very uh, by the book, cut and dry. Um, you know, it felt like one of those very atypical 90s movies like Snake Eyes or something like with Nick Cage or I don't know. It just felt like a very um, by the book, nothing crazy, play it safe kind of movie. And uh, th- there was nothing really uh, technical to engage it. Whereas Cure for Wellness, on the other hand, was the exact opposite, uh, where I was, w- and we talked about this, where, you know, the sound design, the cinematography, uh, the music, all the setting, the, you know, the Germany and, and uh, the backdrop of Switzerland and all these things, the Alps in the background, that was all so dynamic. Um, it's also interesting that both these movies were filmed in Germany. So it's like, uh, what a diverse... Uh, couple of couple of films you know one was um like i said so so bland and and uh dry and one was so dynamic and uh you know from visually and and audibly um technically speaking but uh but the other one is like the you know as far as the story goes um i will say i will concede that i'm more interested in a pre-berlin wall year before gorbachev gets uh, uh put into power all of that and how it affected those people in East Berlin. I think that that story is something that, uh, you know, I haven't really seen a whole lot of. Maybe there are movies out there that kind of tell those uh, tales of what was going on on the other side of the wall a little bit. But it certainly was interesting uh, for me to uh, kind of go into that world a little bit, immerse myself in East Berlin on the other side of the wall, Mm -hmm. uh, how the falling of the wall impacted the characters. It would have been nice if that maybe happened a little earlier in the film. So I could have seen uh, how, you know, I'm a big history guy. I like that kind of thing. So that would have been neat. To, uh, but Cure for Wellness, on the other hand, was the polar opposite. Thoughts? Yeah, no. I mean, I think you're. I think that I appreciate what you're trying to say. Here's the thing. I actually disagree about the technical merits of this film. I actually think that the lives of others, we both agree about a cure for wellness, right? I mean, it's it's there's no denying that's a beautiful technically sound film from the aural aspects to the visual aspects everything in between there's nothing really technically wrong with a cure for wellness everything has to do with the story and you know in my opinion the acting etc i thought that this movie was really well photographed i thought that wow now here's the thing because this movie is really subtle so like it doesn't hit you over the head right it's it's a subtle film but When you look at the way, so for example, like there's a scene earlier on in the club and the, the, the camera's just kind of moving through and it allows just the green of the set design to really pop. And we have this sort of green walls and these green curtains and we see green come up a lot. It's the color of the apartment for uh, George and Krista. It's the color of the halls. Um, You know, so we do sort of have that sort of visual theme represented um, and then the thing about the the thing about the way that this film operates is that it's very even the camera movements are subtle. So, for example, we would get these sort of intercut scenes where there would be the Weisler character and he's surveilling them in, you know, the little closet bunker, wherever it is with all of the equipment and his little headphones. And you would notice that the camera would be behind him very sort of slowly tracking from right to left right sort of in a little almost an arc around him as he sits there and surveils right and then so you take the scene where george is playing the piano um the 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 piano song it's like an expression of his sadness after it's revealed that uh, the director jerka i think was his name or something after he kills himself and so he's sitting uh the george character that is he's sitting at the piano and he's playing this song and the camera is pushing the other way <clears throat> you know, it's moving from left to right, and it's sort of like uh, pushing in a little bit closer as it does so. And so we get these kind of very interesting camera motions that are juxtapositions where it'll be moving one way, you know, when we're with one character, it'll be moving another way where it's another. There'll be slow push in, slow pull outs. Everything's very slow and subtle. And so I think it's really just a matter of the fact that this movie has these things that you're talking about, but it doesn't hit you over the head with them. And, you know, if you're if you if you don't appreciate subtle filmmaking, maybe like that's not going to come through and you're, you're not going to dig it. But I think I think the things are there that you're not that you're saying that aren't. No, I think you're just looking for them <laughs> really hard. <laughs> All right. So, you know, comparing these films for me, um, 
I think that both of them, like we mentioned, are beautifully photographed, very technically pr proficient. They're both films that aren't afraid to languish in their sensibilities, be a little bit slower, allow you to take them in. In my opinion, it, uh, it works much better for the lives of others than A Cure for Wellness. Obviously, you feel differently, Ryan, but that's my opinion on that. I think, as I alluded to earlier in the show, both films resist the baser instincts of their genres, and I think that's what makes them interesting films. So again, with the lives of others, it, we already discussed this, so you know, just to reiterate, just the fact that it does resist all of those tropes, and it's not some, you know, Tom Cruise, you know, Morgan Freeman exciting political thriller where, you know, they're going to catch the assassin at the last minute when, you know, he's campaigning and da-da-da. Like, those films are cool. Don't get me wrong. They're great films. They're, they, they're effectively done. Uh, when they're effectively done, they're good at what they do. But it was refreshing to get a different take on this. I kind of liked the fact that it was a little more detached of a style, you know, but also still managed for me to be emotionally captivating. I thought it allowed the performance and the technical merits to just deliver the tension as opposed to needing and we didn't even mention the score the score was really great too maybe maybe you're just over the film you're not even you don't even really care about the score at that point but it was it had this very operatic quality you know it felt like uh, again watching an older opera with uh, the score that had you know a lot of the same instruments uh, that come with orchestras but also just sort of underscoring uh, what's going on on screen without beating you over the head with it so and then of course you know they're both long quiet, drawn out films. They just give you that time to exist in their world. Uh, you know, whether it's to the film's benefit or detriment, I think ultimately the lives of others did it better, but that's my take, man. That, that is a take. <laughs> 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 All right, man. Well, like I said, dude, I'm actually glad that we finally disagree on a film for once. Uh, this was fun to kind of take a little bit of a different, uh, you know, one of us on the offensive and the other on the defensive and vice versa. And so uh, we'll have to see kind of, you know, what happens next. But uh, we never really know what's going to happen because we never really know what films we're going to get, Ryan, right? It's like a bo lo box of chocolates, right? <laughs> that it is. And speaking of a box of chocolates, I think it's time to dive in. What do you think? Let's do it. All right, guys. So this is one of my favorite parts of this program. Hopefully it is for you as well. Uh, this is the part where we get to select next episode's films that we are going to be taking a look at and just to once again sort of reiterate the films that make it on this list they're not your major mainstream films you know we're not going to have big action movies there's not going to be Schwarzenegger films and Stallone films I mean we both love action movies but it's just you know everybody's seen those movies so you know if everybody's seen it it's not going to be on this list we have no Blade Runners. It's a little we more have off no the beaten path. Yeah, exactly. You know, we we're not going to do. You know, I think the one Spielberg film we have on this list is Duel, which was his first like made-for-TV movie with the truck, which I haven't seen. Have you seen that one? Uh, I have a long time ago. Yeah, so you know, but we're not putting ET on here, which you know, great film, but again, everybody's seen it, super popular. So like some of the films that I'm looking at right now. Um, some of them might have even have been really popular back in their day, but have since just kind of disappeared because maybe like it's an old movie. So like I've never seen, for example, Arsenic and Old Lace, you know, the old Cagney movie and like, whoa, uh, really? Yeah, yeah, oh, That's exactly. a good one. I like that one a lot. Yeah, a lot of people do, you know, and I think it's just one of those things where again, like, you know, I mean, at this point we're going on what, 70 years, 80 years, something like that. I mean, we've got films that are literally about to be, you know, they're 90 years old going on a hundred in here. Um, you know, we've got films like Haxon, which is, you know, pretty much like a silent sort of gothic horror film. Um, you know, we've got some more current things. We've got Honey Boy on here. Um, we've got some silly stuff. Like, I, I never saw Popstar, but everybody tells me it's something I need to see. Oh, so let's dude, throw I love that here. movie. Yeah, everybody says it's great. That's fantastic. But, you know, at the same time, like, like I really like Brooklyn Nine-Nine, but uh, I hated Hot Rod, for example. Like, like fucking hated hot rod dude so like yeah, i've never seen hot rod oh it's or so MacGruber. bad i've never seen mcgruber either have you seen mcgruber no no never caught that one right um and okay. then you know and then we've also got uh you know like some really classic kurosawa like the bad sleep well so i mean this film is really just all over the place with regards to the types of films that are being represented and ultimately i think it's that variety that lends itself to such an interesting comparison feature that we do at the end of the episode um, because again, you know, like right now I'm looking at, oh, we have another Spielberg film, actually. Uh, you threw this one on here, The Color Purple, 
which I never saw. But imagine if in the same episode we pulled the color purple one and Zardoz two, right? <laughs> like that would having be, to uh, compare that'd be crazy. <laughs> so, but again, hopefully it's fun <laughs> and it's interesting. And you know, I think that's a conversation that may very well never have taken place on the planet Earth. Someone in a bar comparing Zardoz to the color purple. I think I could compare those purple. movies. Actually, I think I could compare those movies. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so I think this list is a lot of fun. I think that, um, it allows us to sort of, you know, cause I mean, look like there's films on here where it's like, oh yeah, we've been meaning to check that out for decades. And it's just that movie where like, you can never quite make it happen. Maybe you even rented it once and you literally sat down with your popcorn and you were going to watch it. And then you're like, ah, let me just check my phone first, stick around for an hour. You're like, oh, you know what? It's too late now. Can't watch. Like there's just those movies where for whatever reason, we never get around to watching them. Right. We always push them back. Well, it, and what's neat is too. uh, what, what's neat too, is that, uh, you know, it's a constantly evolving list. Uh, we're adding to it kind of switching things around. So if you're out there listening and you want to recommend anything, you've heard Jason's description of what our list is, and you're like, oh, I wonder if they have this on the list, reach out to us, get us, get a hold of us on Twitter. Uh, we're always looking for new stuff to watch. And uh, that was one of the things, Jason, that, that really attracted me to this podcast and, and teaming in and jumping in with you is that uh, you and I have always had that dynamic to challenge each other to watch stuff, you know, mm-hmm. and, and make recommendations. Have you seen this? It was fantastic. Or I'm about to watch it and wondering how it was, this and that. Yeah. So uh, this was a, a really engaging way for you to make half a list and me to make half a list and uh it'd be really neat to uh, again get our listeners all three of you out there we <laughs> so dive right in and uh, <laughs> let us know what to watch because it can't be uh worse than the lives of others uh, oh, so man. if you're feeling a little insecure dive right in because you know jason did look uh, at how it turned out I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna punch you next time i see you in person i'm gonna give you a giant hug oh. and then i'm gonna punch you in the face <laughs> and i'm gonna say that's for the lives of others so, so with that said, this is one of my favorite uh, f- favorite parts of the show. So why don't you go ahead and roll the dice? Let's see what we're watching. <laughs> All right, guys. So we're going to go to our random.org, true random number generator. Uh, I did manage to sneak a few more uh, films on the list, Ryan. So we're up to a solid 155 now. I'm really trying to ease up cool. off the gas pedal uh, because, you know, it's just going to get unwieldy. And we do want to ke- leave that space for the listeners. Uh, like Ryan said, you can reach us on Twitter at Esoterica Cinema. You can also send us emails, uh, esotericacinema at gmail.com, and let us know what you want to add. And who knows, maybe we'll even respond to you on the air one day. But let's go ahead. So 1 through 155, random.org, true generator number. Okay, we're we're at the end here, uh, 149. So as I come over to Ooh. my list... I look at one four. Is it Zardoz? Oh, Tell me dude. it's Zardoz. <laughs> no, no, but I think I think uh, I think you might kind of hate me a little bit. Uh, I don't know. Uh, do you know Wild Strawberries? Oh, it's kind of another like tonight. European existential kind of art house film, <laughs> which okay. I know are not always your favorite. <laughs> Is it four four and a half hours long? No, no, dude. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, man. I'm looking it up right now. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and check hey. it out. It's a it's an Ingmar Bergman film. Oh, okay, cool. I can get down with that. Yeah, 1957? yeah. 1957? So, yeah, dude. So, like, I don't know if you've seen, like, uh, you know, like, uh, what is it, Seventh Seal or something like that? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. I'm good with that. Yeah, yeah. Dude, so. just because I didn't like the lives of others doesn't mean everything has to be Avengers Infinity War. <laughs> I, know, you know, I know, I just thought that was a crap movie. <laughs> no, 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 I know. But I was also <laughs> referencing the fact because I think, uh, I think, the last episode when we were talking about um like if we had pulled Fitz Caraldo right after Aguirre, how like that would have just been too much German existentialism for like right, two right, right. episodes yeah. in a row. Yeah. And so now instead of German existentialism, you get well. Swedish existentialism. So there you go. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> you know, it wasn't an existentialism. That was uh, just a boring movie. Let's just call it yes. call it what it is, man. Uh, yeah. No. And it's only also uh it's worth noting. An hour and 31 minutes, everybody. So if yes. you're with us on the last one and you watch those last two movies, we know Cure for Wellness was a long one. Uh, Lives of Others was a long one. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, Jason and I talked about it uh, off off radio here, but uh, we got a little spoiled last week with uh, Fritz the Cat and Swiss Army Man. So yeah. we're back in that hour and a half time frame. <laughs> Give this one a watch. And uh, what's uh, what's our next movie? Yeah, it's funny because apparently, apparently, the average two-hour movie length does not apply to our list. You get one, you get an hour and a half or two and a half hours, no in between. 
Uh, okay, so let's see. <laughs> Number two on our list. We're going to roll the dice here, and we're going to come up with 99. So, oh, man. <laughs> this is going to be uh, this is going to be some sort of, uh, of week, man. And this is... This is the exact opposite of Wild Strawberries in terms of length. Uh, we are going to be watching 1972's Solaris. Are you familiar? No. Three-hour art house space epic. Very little dialogue. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's what, but, dude. 1972 is a big year for movies. Apparently, we're uh, we're hammering out the 1972 films. Yeah, yeah. No, we we definitely got some good ones, and it's interesting because uh, it's actually a okay, Russian. Okay, Tarkovsky. Film. Got yeah, it. yeah, yeah. It's Tarkovsky. So it's a Russian film. Uh, Andre Tarkovsky, who also did Stalker, which is on this list, um, and uh, yeah, it's the movie that Soderbergh, I believe, remade with George Clooney in the late 2000s, and apparently that version yeah, is far uh-huh, inferior. He did. Um, I never saw either of them. I haven't, I haven't seen it. Uh, there are people that adore it. You know, the, the, the 72 Solaris, uh, as you know, this work of high art that's to be revered. Other people are like, man, this movie's slow and boring and nothing happens. So I'm sorry to say, Ryan, like if you thought the lives of others was slow and boring, there's a very good chance that you're going to hate Solaris. Cause my understanding is not much happens. Great. <laughs> so you're welcome, buddy. Well, I'm glad they took two hours and 47 minutes to show us not much happening then. That's fantastic. <laughs> Why the hell? And it's PG. There's not even any nudity, man. Yeah, no, I'm... I don't I'm, even know how I'm going to get through this one. Okay, look, but so so split it up. You know, you've got a, a, a two-hour 45 on the one, and you've got an hour and a half on the other. So that gives us 4.15, cut in two. We're looking at an average of two hours and seven and a half minutes. So just look at the average, buddy. Look at the average. I'm going to watch the George Clooney one. <laughs> <laughs> Does not count. Have you seen a Tarkovsky film? Have I? I, I? I haven't. That's that's absolutely why both, you know, Solaris and Stalker. Yeah, I don't list. think I, I don't honestly, I don't think I have. We, we, we can't be self-respecting film nerds that haven't seen Tarkovsky, dude. It's, it's kind of, you know, mm-hmm. even if it's like a Fritz the Cat thing where it's just like, you know, you got to see it once to get it out of the way. I feel like there's still going to be value in it. Um, but again, we certainly did not get any genre films here today. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of pontificating about the meaning of life with, uh, these couple films. Again, one Swedish film in Wild Strawberries, another Russian film in Solaris. And, uh, I'm still looking forward to it, dude. I love it. I love every single movie on this list. Uh, you know, it may be, it may be a little bit of a longer hard watch, but at the same time, who knows, you know, but uh, I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait to discuss this on the next episode with you. And again, buddy, I'm sorry to give you two long ass uh, art house silent films or near silent films in a row. Maybe next week we can get some Elvira Mistress of the Dark on there. That'd be good. <laughs> Don't forget, guys, you can <laughs> uh, hit us up on Twitter at Esoterica Cinema. Be sure to give us that follow. We appreciate it. And let us know what you think of the show. We love to interact as well as you can send us emails, esotericacinema at gmail.com. It's been great hanging out with you guys. We will see you next week with Wild Strawberries and Solaris. Greetings, friends. Do you wish to know the secret to everlasting life? Do you have unfinished business stretching back centuries that requires your immediate attention? Do you have an underage daughter that you wish to sexually assault for dynastic purposes based on outdated modalities of thought and purity in your bloodline? Then I have just a prescription for you, Dr. Volmer's Magical Seaside Elixir. Other elixirs claim to be 100% natural, but only my patented formula gives you the vitamins and nutrients your body needs as we search for the cure. Think of it as a cleansing of the mind, not just the body. What's our secret, you ask? Well, I could tell you, but it would be a slippery slope. I'm afraid divulging my secrets might make me a little salty. Even if I revealed, you probably wouldn't believe me. Side effects include increased heart rate, primordial memories, fake injuries, falling out of teeth, excessive foreshadowing, switching from German to British accent without notice, and long stretches of nothing happening for extended periods of time. But rest assured, that's just the toxins leaving the body. Give yourself over to the process completely and you'll see the results with Dr. Volmer's Magical Seaside Elixir. Available at Walgreens and other fine retailers. 
From the visionary minds at Aberrant Literature comes a short fiction collection unlike any other, Aberrant Tales. Bursting at the seams with stories of creativity, excitement and wonder, Aberrant Tales takes the very best in modern science fiction, fantasy and horror and weaves them into one thrilling eclectic package. Featuring the works of Ashton McCauley, M.T. Roberts, Daniel Curland and Jason Peters, Aberrant Tales is available today in ebook, hardcover and paperback versions. Online and everywhere books are sold. Published by Aberrant Literature.